There we go. So if you guys are listening to this one, I recorded this previously. It's Saturday, 9 a.m. Welcome to Red Morning. I actually get to be a fanboy this time instead of you. And I got Billy Pratt here talking about his book, Welcome to Hell. Hey, how's it going, Billy? Hey, Ryan, what's going on? So, so glad that we finally kind of got together on this. We've been talking about doing a show together for a long time now. I know. Well, heck, I was talking about reading your book for a long time. I'm just glad you, like, it's been out. How many months has it been out for now? It has been out since June. Oh, yeah, dude. It's all oh, the fun time. I think, what's it, the first couple, the first six months were always like the fun peak time where it keeps going up and you get that initial boost and then you start to see how popular your book is. I have to ask you one question, though. Do you do you check your stats every day or no? <laughs> multiple times, multiple times <laughs> per day. And um, yeah, I've been getting a lot of really good buzz lately. Um, my stats have been, I had a little slump, like January, February, and I feel like I'm back under you know, sometimes hitting under 50,000, which if you're not an author geek like Ryan and myself, uh, under 50,000 50, in an Amazon ranking is, is pretty good for an independent author. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. I think it works as long as you're like, it's the top 100 does some crazy is crazy. And then everything below that is awesome to like you said, that rank. And then after that, it gets into the whole gumroad course, just chilling, whatever <laughs> out, Bigfoot porn. But uh but, oh, so I want to start with, uh, if you guys don't know, the book's called Welcome to Hell. It's got a neat little cover, which I'll get into later. I was going to start by doing my CBC Radio 3 praise for the Welcome to Hell book. It's one of my favorite parts right at the start. Uh, and I was hoping you can elaborate on like how these, these pieces came about. The first one is from Mencius Moldbugman. He wrote the ending bigly Many Fates of Donald Trump book. And he said, Billy Pratt wanders or wanders and wonders through the ruins of what is left in our civilization and provides poolside musings of the facade of what passes for human relationships in our atomized present day with more than a helping of melancholy and longing for things which are now past pratt writes in the mold of delicious tacos midway through an existential crisis enjoy these despairing tacos and the second one is from you guys may remember him as well from twitter zero hp lovecraft with this collection is, as they say, a mood, an elegy for a lost Americana, a memory of a place you've never been. If seduction is getting lost in incomparable alienage of the other and writing is teasing out the universal from the particular, then Billy tries to capture a universal sense of feeling lost. You will be able to see how much he cares. I guess I did see how much you care. <laughs> Yeah, like those. That's actually some really, that's like some really cool praise in there is almost like an introduction there. How did those come about? Well, you know, it's funny because um, becoming a writer in today's world is both easier and harder than ever. Um, mm -hmm. Easier because you have the tools in front of you. I mean, I'm, I'm holding one of the tools that made most of this possible, right? I'm, I'm on my phone right now. I'm talking to you on my iPhone. I tweet from my iPhone. I, I've written from my iPhone. I edit. I have my Google Drive. Like everything from this one device that is in your hand. Let's be real. Most of the day, or at least in my hand, most of the day. Right. Um, yeah. So I mean, you have those tools in front of you. But in today's world, if you want to be a writer, even if you are as talented as hell, you have to be good at Twitter. You have to be good at social networking, getting attention. You need to be good at. Um, you know, befriending these big accounts who are going to want to, you know, use your content, retweet you, you know, it's kind of a mutual exchange, you know, making friends with these guys. And I've been fortunate. I've been very fortunate to um, my blog, Kill to Party, that I started writing on, uh, God, seven years ago now. Um, it's been that long? It's been that long. And I got attention from it from day one which was really, really nice. I mean, it's tough to plug away getting 30 views per per essay, per blog. But um, Hartiste was nice enough to, when he was still around, retweet a, a few of my essays that got massive, massive views from one tweet from Hartiste. It was so that, crazy. Was this, was this Hartiste on Gab or was this Hartiste when he was still on Twitter? This was on Twitter 2015. Oh man, that's crazy. Actually, I think that might have been originally Roycey then, because do you know the story about Roycey? I think he sold it to, to some other people. Yeah, no, no, no. Before that, though, the he got doxxed by, I think the per person's pen name was Lady Rain back when like the feminists were the big enemy. Oh, wow. Yeah, and then at that point, he sold it off, like you said, to a couple different authors, and that's when they went all New World Order lizard right. people and the funky hats guys rubbing their hands together stuff. Right. So kind of 
which sucked because I was like, I really liked reading his book, but I'm like, oh man, now it sounds like he hates my melanin. <laughs> oh man. But that's cool. So you got in like right at the tail end there. I got in. Funny. I don't remember where, which post, do you remember which post it was that he? I absolutely do. He retweeted mm -hmm. two of them. Um, one was uh, an essay I wrote on the first episode of The Simpsons and how The Simpsons um, started with uh, not Homer as the stupid dad who's set up for jokes, but Homer is a sympathetic figure. Yeah. Um, so the first, like the original Simpsons had like a deep respect for fatherhood and how fatherhood is kind of like morphed over the years and dad gets a lot of abuse rather than dad doesn't deserve respect. Dad's an idiot, which he you oh, know, yeah. later, later became. Yeah. He retweeted that. And I remember before I realized what had happened, I thought WordPress was broken because every swipe, <laughs> every swipe, every second, it was getting like hundreds of more views. And I was like, how could this possibly be happening? That's the most writer thing I've ever heard. I think my website's broken. It's getting views. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, that's but, awesome, though. I mean, and I, I'm pretty sure Hartis knew me from before even starting my blog, having just posted on Reddit's The Red Pill. Oh, that's right. I remember seeing you in there, too. It's. I remember... Because you had put some nice stuff. The first thing I read of yours was your uh, Elizabeth Warren MTV essay. I think it was the first one okay. I remember anyway. And you wrote, you put it in there and I kind of picked out the lessons from it. And then there was like a group of like six guys who decided to completely miss the point and treat you like that uh, bitch ex-wife. And they just went out and you were like, why am I here? I'm not put on earth to deal with this abuse for nothing. And I, can, I remember you posted a few more, but you were kind of like, all right, whatever. <laughs> yeah, so there's just too many guys on that board where if you're not giving them like, here are the words to say to a woman, they will not react very well. Yeah, which is weird because that's kind of one of the skills you have to learn is how to how to carry a conversation, how to improvise or right. just how to run your mouth for 20 minutes without running out of steam, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, yeah, so again like you you to to end up with a book you're probably doing four or five years of building up an online reputation where you're you know you're making friends with people who have bigger accounts than you you're kind of setting everything in place in order to put out a book and not have it sell 10 copies mm -hmm. well that's because that's the one thing that's hilarious uh i don't know if you know aaron clary and richard cooper also authors they have this like little beef going where clary has written i think he's written like 10 books now uh, bachelor pet economics they're all pretty fun reads and rich put out his first one and because rich is like you said he did the thing build a big brand he has a giant yeah. youtube channel crazy like you would kill I, i'll tell you off camera the kind of sales he pulls in a month but it's like something that makes us feel like depressed <laughs> but <laughs> it's funny though because we read the books clary is a better writer like rich's book is great and it's his first book and everybody's first book is always the worst out of all of them but just because he has that name recognition and that's kind of getting to your point is that you almost have to be a better marketer than a better writer. And you've managed to, I would argue, manage to thread the needle. Like you, you're you very, gotta, you gotta do it all. You gotta be yeah. a personality on podcasts. You have to um, have good Twitter posts combined with the, the, the shitty Twitter posts that are the ones that go viral. I mean, it's, it's unreal. Yeah. Which I love your new campaign, the uh, welcome to hell series. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. It's, I, you know, it's, it's zero HP actually gave me advice on that. I thought it was running out of steam and he's like, no, dude, think people like repetition, go harder, go harder on it. And I mean, even right now I have a, I have a, my, my last welcome to hell tweet, I think got right now, 1500 retweets. So, oh, that's not bad at all. Right. And right. that's great. Yeah. Like out of those, and that's the beauty of it. Those 1500 people who maybe didn't know about you beforehand. Now they've learned about you, plus all the people that just didn't engage and just saw it. And of those, just even if like 1% of them are readers, that becomes Absolutely. like 1% lifelong fans. And it's great because they never would have known about you if you weren't making Casey Anthony jokes. Which, you know, know. It's good to see some good coming out of that situation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I like looking at it that way. <laughs> uh, okay, I, I'm going to stick back to the thing. I think Casey Anthony jokes are running old quick. Um, I have to ask, so the Billy, the Billy Pratt, why, why that pen name? Cause it is a pen name, right? It is a pen name. Um, bad Billy Pratt. You know, you're, you're the first person Ryan to, to ask me and I'm going to give you the scoop. Um, mm. it's from a movie. It's from a Goldie Hawn, Kurt Russell movie from 1987 the bird called, cage? Over, called Overboard. Oh, Overboard. Overboard. 
Um, not the name of Kurt Russell. He's uh, Dean Prophet. But his best friend is Bad Billy Pratt. And th I think the name is just, I love how this minor character has this like, nickname like, like he has like this full i don't know i just thought it was it, it, there was something so american about that name and i feel like um i wanted something kind of like working working class american to kind of go off of dude i actually like that see i don't know why people don't it's the little details i think that make everything because like you said there the the working class hero it's got that 1960s pulp novel right like jack speed or stuff like that you put that all together and nobody thinks about it. But as you're reading, as you're reading your stuff, you kind of get these images in your head because you've been raised watching, you know, GI Joe and transformers and all these like little catchy, strong, like uh flyover state nicknames. They kind of put an image in your head. So when you read this one and I, when I first read it, I kind of read it like that. But the fun part about it was I, I think it was, uh, which one was it? It may have been Lovecraft who talked about it, how it's kind of like a melancholy, that fight club scene where it's like uh, their biggest war is the not having a war bit there, but it's kind right. of as if that Americana pulp character was sitting here in an existential despair situation. And it's, I don't know the, the contrast just kind of, I enjoyed it. It's at least something that I have not seen before. And in the age of social media, that's really hard to find. If yeah. you don't mind me fluffing you a bit. Oh, hey, I love it. But, um, yeah, I mean, that kind of just goes with my point before that you need to be great at everything. Um, you need like every like you, you can't phone anything in like every every part of your brand needs to really be on point in order to, you know, gain success in this world. And like I said, like you have the tools, but there's a lot of stuff to get right. Yeah. Which is interesting, too, because I think you can go wrong because I don't know about the same time you released yours. There is, I don't know if this is an author you've ever heard of, Roman McClay. You ever heard of the name? I haven't. Okay, so he wrote a book called Sanction. It's like a million words. It's a giant read. I tried to get through the first chapter. Oh, is that the guy after... who, who uh, did a oh, bad thing? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so he got a lot of buzz. And this is why, like I told you before, like I was reading your book. I made sure I finished it before we got here. At least it was, a, I had to skim to read it quickly the first time, but. Because everybody was talking about how great his podcast was. He was great at marketing. He was great at talking it. And all the guys that were interviewing him talking about how it was the greatest book ever, the greatest this, the greatest that. Then he goes and murders six people. And now everybody's like deleting YouTube videos left and right. And I'm like, I tried to read the first chapter. And I'm like, what are they seeing that I don't? Because this reads like literally sitting on the typewriter at the hotel in, Col in uh, Rhode Island or wherever the, the Shining was. And it's like, yeah, dull boy. I like it. Good ending. You know, uh, where was I going with this one? Oh, yes. Thank you for not murdering anybody because this is going to be super <laughs> embarrassing and I'm going to have to leave this up because I got too much pride not to. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, where do you go from there. <laughs> I, I think my book is really excellent. I do. Um, I believe in every, I, I mean, I, I just destroyed the editing process. I must have read it 60 or 70 times. Um, well, that's, that's my other question. Do you hate your book now? I did everybody when I was done. Yeah, I, I everybody edited that it hates it. <laughs> the editing process ends when you hate it. Yeah. I think when it's like, I can't, I can't do this again. It's good enough. It's, you know, I was, I got to a point where I was changing stuff and then changing it back. And then the next time I change it again, like there's, there's, you know, there's no right answer sometimes to some of the stuff. Um, just pick a voice and go with it. It's you, you just pick a voice and go with it. Um, just try to, you know, have each sentence not be clunky. Um, you know, have your have your prose sound beautiful when read aloud as best you can. That's that's the advice I give people. Um, yeah, but there just there just comes a point where you have to say this was what I wrote at this time in my life. It you know it is what it is, and it's I'm releasing it out into the world and moving on to something else. Dude, awesome. Okay, so then so now here's my question to it. So when I was reading through it, I had two opinions of an overarching narrative that there was one. So I'll throw those out to you and I want to hear your thoughts. Sure. Uh, the first one is as I was reading through it and I'm like, you know what? This reads like you're telling a story about how everybody nowadays refuses to be happy and they will only make decisions to ruin their life. And so welcome to hell. If I could sum it up. And then the second one was a collection of sort stories with uh, an exaggerated life, like taking your life and then adding flair to it. And I'm not quite sure which one it is or if I'm even close. So I, I had to ask. 
Um, okay, the truth is that all of that came from my life, for better or worse. And I didn't want any of it to come off like, um, like uh, I'm trying to show off or glamorize or do the do, do the typical manosphere posturing. Yeah. So yeah, well, no, it's raw. Like it is raw. Um, I, I do. I tell a story about a threesome, but I try. You know, I I, I kind of give it like it, it's dumb. Like I thought it was dumb. Um, I thought it was dumb as I was doing it. I thought it was dumb after. Um, the 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 only <laughs> in this story, the only thing that I I kind of like reflect fondly on is thinking about her like taking a shower after and just feeling disgust from what she did. You know, the not the not my girlfriend, the the other the other party, the other girl, yeah, the other girl. So. Yeah, I do tell stories about sex, um, but I wanted to focus more on disappointment. I wanted to focus more on on heartbreak because I feel like the modern world kind of sets us up to expect a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I think the modern world is full of promises, you know, and I think that definitely I'm not a genius, so I can't really suss this out. But there's something there's elements of capitalism in kind of all all areas of our lives where we're sold this you know, adventure of, of youth, right? We're sold this adventure of like, you're going to be dating all around. You're going to be, you know, you're going to be going to college and having this crazy party lifestyle. You're going to be, you know, getting laid left and right. Cause it just happens. Right. We just all get laid. Um, raised on Miller light commercials. I love it. <laughs> raised on Miller and you know, Miller light commercials during breaks from Seinfeld. Cause I see <laughs> Seinfeld as kind of, the model of what I expected, maybe not my college years to be, but what I expected my, my adult life to be where, um, I wasn't someone who wanted to get married from day one. And I guess I achieved that goal. Congrats. Um, yeah, thank you. But I did, I expected my adult life to be where, well, like what woman am I dating this week? Oh, I'm in this apartment building and my friends are just popping in and out. And it's like all so much fun. And the fun only ends when you decide that it should. And hmm. real life didn't ever match up that way. It so did make I, a good story, though. I'll give it that. <laughs> so I think that I really, Welcome to Hell, is about those expectations people have and um, the, the kind of disappointment that that kind of the after the party, the aftermath. The hangover, the literary version. Well, that's funny because that was one of the questions I had in my notes here. It was an essay, it was right near the end where you talk about she was the perfect girl, so I had to break up with her. And my the notes here exactly how you just worded it there. It's like a self-sabotage story minus the Hank Moody self-destruction. As if like, uh, as if you don't even get that benefit of like drinking yourself to be a total slob or drink yourself to death or no heroin overdoses. It's just kind of like, eh, just went out with a sputter. So you you miss like the glamorization of self-destruction, but you get all the the benefits of it. And right. then Fight Club, the Great War, the Great War is inside of ourselves. So that's hilarious. So it's the one good thing. Well, one of the many good things I can say about the book is that you captured it to the point that it's very obvious when you read it, that's what you were trying for. And I think, isn't that the writer's goal is to communicate something and have the other guy get it? The writer's goal is to communicate and have somebody else get it. But my goal is always, I want to make you feel it. I want to, I don't want to just have it be where, oh, I'm explaining this theory to you and the theory makes sense. I want to take you through the steps where you are feeling it. Um, and people tell me that more often than not, that my book is so depressing. Maybe I've read it too many times. I didn't think it was depressing, but I definitely wanted you to have moments where you could kind of like your, your own heartbreak, your own disappointment kind of surfaces and you kind of make those connections. Oh, yeah. Now, granted, I'm the same as you. Like, I don't see the heartbreak in it, but I'm kind of jaded. A bit. I've seen some <laughs> shit. But at the same time, it at least, like, I look at it and there's nothing from it that, like you said, th no bravado. And that's the one thing that always turns me off of books is when the guy is just thinking, I'm awesome and you all need to know how awesome I am. In which case, like, nobody cares if you're awesome. Like, you right. know, that's, you know, that's just, what do they call it? The, uh, the, uh, the real, the highlight reel when you want to see the reel. bloopers. It's kind of like how they say women use women use conversation as self talk. Um, even on Twitter, I feel mm -hmm. like women you mostly use language as, as self talk, right? To kind of convince themselves of a certain narrative of their life is real, and yeah. they want they want other women to to you know acknowledge that. Um, I feel like that's like the male version is like, nah, dude, I'm awesome, and I'm gonna like humble brag my way 
through an essay to let you know how awesome I am. Girls delude themselves. Guys just lie to you. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Dude, I like it. Yeah, the whole thing. Um, all right, so put that one in there. Yeah, it's, like I said, you get that thing, and I know what you're talking about, too, with a lot of guys when they're writing their books. They write them like it's an engineering manual. Yes. And it's the one thing, I think, and I know I've name-dropped them twice, but whatever. Rolo Tomasi was talking about this, where uh, the Great Awakening, right? Guys are waking up to life isn't what you were promised, like you were saying. It's not Seinfeld with Miller Lite commercials like we were kind of promised or it was inferred in our advertising, capitalism, whatever. And that you kind of show warts and all. It gives a very honest assessment. Now, the part I like about it, though, is I call it, I used to call it soft R artists. <laughs> okay. So if you can kind of, yeah, it's like re referencing autism. So I like to call it yours oh, okay. hard R. artists. Got it. Yeah. Hard R artism. <laughs> <laughs> Well, cause you're right. Cause like, you don't, you don't tell me what to think you show me, you don't, or the author, the reader, I guess, not me. It's not about me. It's about the reader. You don't, don't tell them what to think. You just show them things. And then yeah. they're real enough that the guy should be able to feel something. And if he's not at the very least, he can get a glimpse into what it's like to be in these situations, which I think is helpful. And you know, have imagine the courage, when he gets in that situation, it'll, it'll, it'll come up. He's like, Hey, this sounds really familiar. Yeah. I, I, I think that the best writers have the courage to not, I mean, if they're me memoir writers, right, of course, yeah, yeah. have the courage to not always be the hero of their story. And I think you see too much of that as well. Like, I want I want to take, I mean, my, my book is, you know, I do come from the manosphere, so I am critical of women in my book, and I'm not afraid oh. to really go there. But Manosphere is not even a thing. But anyways, it, I, I'm cutting you off. I want to hear, I want to hear your thought. Um. I am, I hold myself as accountable as anyone in the book. And that's, that's really what I want. Like one of the takeaways to be that you can, you know, I mean, whatever you want to call it, but the Manosphere's whole MO is that um, we're, you know, so critical of women, but they somehow just exclude themselves from any criticism. And it's, it's the strangest thing. And I, I do get that a lot of guys are going through kind of like um, a, a cleansing period, I guess, of sorts from the mainstream narrative. So who needs to beat up men more? Maybe that has to do with it. But mm. um, all of these things that we, we blame women for, or kind of like say, we call female nature or whatever, you could find a lot of that, you know, in, in ourselves as well. Oh, dude, of course. But that's the thing, scorpion and frog, right? And a lot of the guys are just the frog that keeps blaming the scorpion. I don't know. Do you know the parable or am I just kind of rambling here on it? Oh, I don't know the parable. Oh, okay. Yeah. So a frog is sitting at the shore. Scorpion's sitting at the shore. They need to go to the other side. The scorpion's like, hey, can you take me over there? He's like, no, you're going to sting me. The scorpion's like, look, if I sting you, you drown. We both die. I'm not going to sting you. I promise. And the frog's like, fine. So it gets on the frog's back. They swim across the river. And when they're halfway across, the scorpion stings them. The frog's paralyzed. They're sinking down. He goes, why did you do this? You know, we're going to die. He goes, what did you expect? I'm a scorpion. Right. And it's, and that's kind of the impression I got there, except for a lot of guys are just like, they aren't at that part where they're willing to let the scorpion be the scorpion. They have to keep blaming it. Okay. And that's the impression I got, which is another reason why I like this one, because you can't tell them, Hey, don't worry. There's things you can fix on yourself. There's, there's a life that you're going to have and it's not all going to be peaches and cream, but instead you just kind of show them what it's like. You make but dude, it, what you, don't, you, you don't, yeah, you don't like glorify it, but you don't denigrate it either. You're just like, there's life. Good luck. If and then men, the guy has to figure it out for himself. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. But I don't know if I'm, I don't know if we've moved off this point, but if men were offered the same choice women have, it would, it would be the same thing. I mean, like, let's be real. If, if you, if Tinder was like reversed and I was getting all these matches from like super hot girls, like, come on, you know, I mean, oh, yeah. it's, these your, guys your were scale complaining, would, change. would just, would just, you know, they're compl I mean, rightfully complaining that they're not in power, you know? Um, but th I mean, that's, that's really most of the issue here. Yeah, I suppose so. Like I said, I don't know. I find I'm with you in that I just have no patience for that stuff. Cause like, if I'm going to sit here and cry that the sky is blue and it sucks right. for me. Right. At that point, there's some things I could do and that's not going to change. So I don't like, right. uh, was it they call it pissing into the hurricane or something like that? You and, get... and that's the takeaway from any manosphere theory, right? You just yeah. have to accept it and, and do the best you can. So, and this leads into my next question. Here's a good one. You're gonna love this. How do you reconcile the fact 
that. Oh, one sec. I want to make sure I can see your your glowy eyes for this one. Your glowy <laughs> Chevy Chase. How do you reconcile the fact that the people who are most um most needed to take a lesson from this are the least likely to learn it? And they probably wouldn't understand it even if you explained it. So what I mean is like do you have any do you have any attachment to the idea that you can that you can reach somebody like you're talking about there or is it just kind of like good luck like a consultant? Um, I like to think that I painted a picture and whatever you want to take away as the viewer, you could take away. Um, mm -hmm. my book really is not a self-help book. It's really not a book meant to <laughs> improve anyone's life. Um, if you, if it does, oh, literature improves our lives. Don't sell yourself short on that. Good, sir. Oh no, but I'm saying that intentions wise, I just oh, wanted, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I wanted to write a book. I wanted it to have some themes. I wanted it to, you know, be a great read, um, evoke emotion, all that. If, if it helps you, I'm thrilled. And people have told me that my writing has helped them. And I think that's great. But I don't want it to be like I'm setting out to teach anyone lessons. Because then I think it, it kind of gets in the way of the art. Not well, just that's the soft R and the artism. <laughs> right. Okay. Fair enough. So, I mean, yeah, you're probably right that uh, if you, I mean, in order to get it, you have to already have gotten it. And, mm -hmm. you know, and isn't that life, though? I mean, yeah. Got to learn everything to learn, the hard way. Guys lessons. are stupid that way, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, because uh, that's the thing, too, because you're right. In most of the... Actually, you know what I should preface? So when I say the manifest smear doesn't exist, it's because it doesn't. It turns out there was some Jezebel Tumblr writers that wanted to just, like, slight men. This is back during, like, the early Roy C. Tucker Max days, right? Okay. And so in order to, to disparage all guys... They kind of had to think about us as if we were women. What are women if not like a herd or a collective, right? So they had to think of like a sphere of men. They lump you as just like an author doing your thing in with, you know, Tucker Max, who's trying to do frat boy branding in with like champion kickboxer, who's definitely, you know, not a money launderer and take all guys, the best and the worst, and they lump them together in this thing. And they called it the manosphere because blogosphere was big back then. So that way, any guy who is doing anything for a male audience could be painted with the brush of the worst of them. Kind of like how feminism, every girl's a feminist, even though they don't agree, you can't ask them, you ask two people, you get three answers. And so that was the whole reason that thing took off and everybody just kind of adopted it because it was catchy and it's like making it our word. So it's kind of like the end bomb for wow. men, if that makes so sense. So that's where you. the term came from? Yeah, I wish, I remember the original thing, I can't remember what year it came out. I want to say it was like 2009 or something like that. And I, I used to have the Wayback Machine copy of like the first reference to it, and I just oh. don't have it since. But it's one well, of those things that stuck with me. It's like, how, how funny is it that the space that was designed for men who are tired of being typecast ended up being typecast, and then we adopt it and turn it into a caricature of that and a lampooning, which again... It's exactly why I'm sitting here fluffing you right now over your books. I'm like, this is new. This is something where it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you go ahead, have your have your little boy versus girl, six year old dodgeball game. Right. I'm gonna sit here and make something for a guy who wants to read a book and enjoy it. That's better than the sisterhood of traveling pants, you know. Well, I think that's where we are in in like I mean, I'll, I'm gonna use the term, but in, in the lifespan of the manosphere, um, <laughs> like the theory is out there. Rolo right. wrote some excellent books. Uh, you know, the rational male, et cetera. Like the theory is there in dry bullet points if you want it. Now mm -hmm. it's like, what are you going to do with it? Let's make art with it. Let's let's kind of use this as a foundation of of kind of understanding the world around us. Let's move past just teaching guys, pick up theory, you know, female nature, whatever you want to call it, and let's make something of it. So we're past we're past the raising awareness of the men's rights organization. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Raising uh, awareness since 1970. <laughs> <laughs> I, absolutely and i mean it was i i only found the manosphere in 2013 which I, I i mean so what you think the origin is around 2009 well for for the term manosphere the term. guys were blogging before then i mean if you want to talk about like red pill the kind of thing i'm in that started yeah. in 2008 from okay. a guy kaoni galt hawaiian libertarian the pickup oh. stuff started in the alt dot alt dot fast dot seduction in the usenets Right. Back when you still had to dial the phone number for the internet. Right. And that's where mystery would like advertise his boot camps. Exactly. Yeah. That wow, was funny. So, I mean, yeah, it all kind of starts basically with the internet, but then before then you had a lot of the video course stuff and then speed dating where you would just sit in rooms and that. So it's kind of, there's never really been like a quantified start point. 
There's, okay. It's just kind of like evolution where you pick a point and you're like, all right, that's when chimps became people or whatever it was. <laughs> cro right. became people, whatever. Um, I, I mean, when I got in, Roosh was, you know, still still full swing into everything. I think um, I bought I bought and read Day Game at the time, which is like, I, I oh, won't yeah. say the book is cringe, but at least me me sitting and reading reading it in my apartment feels cringe in, res- in retrospect. Oh, they're all cringe. But, you know, it's um, funny because Daybang, the book you're talking about, yeah. they referred to it as like the highlights for children. I don't know if you have that in the States. Do you have highlights yes. for kids? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So if you guys are from Europe or whatever, it's kind of like a, a book that every kid had in elementary school. It was like a learning book and there was that you fold the picture over and you get other things. It's it's like the basic bare bones teaching hooked on phonics for stuff there because he had kind of done the Raphael thing. He took a bunch of everybody's things and he put them together and he dumbed it down to like that anybody can understand this reading level and then put it out there. And I, I would never disparage it. It actually was good for what it was. And you kind of have to, like you said, don't take it literally because it's very cringe. But if you do take it seriously and understand the, the importance of having fun, and I, I mean, it seems to work for you. You can string a sentence together pretty well. I'm assuming you were social beforehand, so I can't say the book <laughs> did all the work. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, uh, yeah. I think that, um, yeah, I think, I think most guys who, who come to the manosphere are not the kissless virgins. I think most people are successful to, to some extent, but don't exactly, uh, aren't exactly able to verbalize what made them successful at the time when they were successful. Yeah. And, and I think that's like the big, you know, the red pill for most guys is like, oh, that's why she liked me. That's why she liked me on day one but at the end of three years she was disgusted by me i said i was gonna i I was even thinking like oh do i bring up that story or not i was guess i was gonna leave this to you for like the second hour just to bring up the stories and the ones you wanted to talk about the most but i'll talk about okay i still have a bunch of questions too i wanted to get on there uh so we did the reconciliation one oh content creators this is technically a little early but i loved how you made a shakespeare quote for content creators it was the part where you're talking about how they just have to and this is absolutely ironic because i'm doing it right now yeah how you have to fill yep. the empty space with something it's sound and fury signaling nothing and i'm i don't know anybody who could manage to fit in something highbrow as shakespeare into a book like this <laughs> it just warms my heart so i just wanted to say thank you on that one and i'm curious then like do you see as an alternative to what you wrote in that section there? Like, would you see there's like a better option or is it just the way the medium is designed that you kind of have to? Um, I was Dude. refer, you know, I was referring to people who um, put themselves in a position to kind of have to do content at like regular intervals because okay. there does come a point where you just have to say something. Like you'll listen to a podcast that's reviewing let's say a wrestling show. Cause I, I do listen to like, you know, we're, we're both wrestling fans. I listen mm-hmm. to wrestling, you know, re- like old retro, like WrestleMania eight, whatever. Seven. Hush you. <laughs> well, I think gotta be seven, did, not six though. Cause you know, the Hulkster lost. Yeah, true. Well, no, that was hero versus hero though. So it was like, it was the first time he lost on a fair fight. I think that was the big <laughs> change in that one. If I'm not mistaken. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. If you guys don't know, that was Ultimate Warrior versus Hogan. I think okay. it was, yeah, six was Hogan versus the Warrior. Yep. yep hero yep. versus Hero. Paved um, the way for such classics like Stone Cold versus The Rock. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there, there are times when it's just like, these guys are, are kind of, I feel smarter than the opinion they're having. And I kind of realized as like doing my own Twitter content that sometimes you just uh, say stuff to say stuff and just to have a point to you know to make uh, it's not always genuine i think is what i'm trying to get at um so you don't care if will smith got slapped or not is what you're trying <laughs> to say here i think someone i think i was on a podcast and someone had asked me about that and no i i really had no take on it i didn't care um yeah i mean if you're doing long form art if you're if you're writing a book i'm going to take everything in that book as as you're you know as, as more genuine but yeah when you're doing social media content i feel like so like so much of it is just bullshit like how many times do i see a welcome to hell post right a, a, something i could grab and slap my book title on that i actually give a shit about sometimes oh, I, yeah you, um, probably not well i mean it depends like uh 
I think the abortion stuff on on social media <laughs> right now is vile. It's, Wait, it's what? Vile. What's going on? What is this? Women make uh, make themselves abortion cakes, like a cake oh. for having an abortion. Um, that stuff just gets me. That stuff is really just like really vile. So it's like the guys bragging about not jerking off on, on <laughs> I, <laughs> like, you know I what I mean? Like sometimes there's just too much information for a social media post. Jeez. Right. Right. Absolutely. So, I mean, but I mean, how many times do I see a post and think this will be a good post? And I think just people, a lot of people kind of approach social media that way where it's less about genuine opinions and more about like, Oh, this is going to do numbers. <laughs> That's funny because I was thinking about this. I talked about it like a year ago with uh, Black Label Logic Carl, another author, fan of your blog, by the way. Mm. And it was like reminding me of a six-year-old soccer game. You know how six-year-olds don't play positions. They just swarm the ball. And yes. If the ball goes that way, they swarm it. And it yep. seemed like whoever got up earliest on Twitter and said the stupidest, most engaging thing on Twitter would then be the topic of conversation amongst all content creators. And it was like the easiest normal example was like the Chris Will Smith slap. Everybody said, everybody had to say something on it. And they're like, how does this fit into uh, entrepreneurs and cars? How does this fit into the Rolex <laughs> Massey brand? Let's yep. talk about hypergamy or I can't even think of other guys right now, but it kind of can imagine some guys working on like a, like a car shop somewhere. He's like, yeah, this is why your brake pads need to be good. It's when you have to get out of there after the slap or something. I'm just like, it always seems so forced. And then it's funny because maybe one or two of them will take off. So it's, it really is like the six-year-old hoping that he gets that one lucky kick, you know? Yep. Yep. So, I mean, yeah, that, that's, that's just kind of the origins of that, where I, where I realized um, maybe not to take people's opinions too seriously. Definitely don't take medical advice from, from anonymous <laughs> Twitter accounts. You s- <laughs> so you're saying smoking doesn't increase my testosterone? <laughs> How dare you, sir? How dare you? <laughs> yeah, man. Our, Twitter's just obsessed with, with pro-smoking. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I've kind of blocked all that stuff. Uh, okay. I don't know if you know, my dad died of lung cancer when I was oh a teenager. God. So okay. for me, I, I just know as soon as somebody starts to talk about in before the smoking ban, I'm going to be in before the, yeah, and I'm like, no, 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 it's Twitter. Let's put it down. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, oh yeah. So this is our, here's another question then. So with your social media stuff, you have like a thing now that's yours, the welcome to hell, like that's yours. Nobody yeah. else has made it before. Have you gotten to a point yet where you see other people kind of like uh i don't want to say stealing because that's the wrong choice of words but like using it from their marketing have you been Um, there yet no no one's used it for their own purposes people have been very generous just strangers like tweeting me stuff to to use for to make my own post there have been people who slap it on um you know an, uh, an applicable you know um item whatever but uh, that and it's funny too. It's more of an I, homage to you then, as opposed to like their own marketing. Sure, but you know, it's funny when when I when I came up with this, um, this no no one's asked me about this one either, which is funny. Hmm. So you got a scoop. Um, when <laughs> this all came from the Bronze Age pervert book, right? Um, and there was a meme that kind of just like came about on its own, and I think sold a ton of copies of books, where there'd be like a some story about like a lion escaping a zoo or like a gorilla beating the shit out of someone. And someone would write on top of that bat book out how long. And (laughs) I thought that was just such genius. Cause like if you get exactly what that book is about in one tweet, you know, and you you could decide on the spot if you want to read something like that, you know, what like a, a, a gorilla just beating the shit out of someone bat book out how long I get it. So I wanted to, you know, um, the premise of welcome to hell or, or maybe not the the end theme but the premise is of course we you know we live in hell the modern world is hell so take these news stories that are written you know for clickbait and so they're like horrifying take these horrifying mm-hmm. news stories and or or even twitter content like those abortion cakes and put my book title on it with a link underneath you get what the book is about yeah, one and a reverent look at some of the horrific things that people think is wonderful to share. Absolutely. Live. Dude, it's great. And that, like, even the title, because, like, you've got Casey Anthony on your title. That is her, is it not? That is her. Okay, I figured it was either her or default friend. I wasn't sure yet. <laughs> <laughs> I jest, I jest. She's good people. Um, the artist, that was the other question I was going to ask you about your artist on there. So you got his name. Where did I put it? Matt Lawrence. Uh, Matt Lawrence. Thank you. 
And so does he know, have you guys heard of um, Eli Schiff and Humans of Flat or no? Yes. Oh, so this kind of reminds me, like, I'm like, was he trying to write it in a Humans of Flat thing? But it also kind of has the same look that you see in a lot of, uh, how to describe them. I don't want to say feminist books, but you know what I mean? Like those early young adult female books where they have that certain art style to it. And it kind of passes back and forth between there. So I don't know how much thought you've had put into the cover, but I would love to hear the story oh, behind it. Absolutely. Um, so I'm not a designer whatsoever. So mm -hmm. when I, when I, you know, when I gave the book to Terror House, I let them figure it out because I didn't have a clue. My, any idea I had would be embarrassing bad. So <laughs> you guys have a go at it. And um, one theme of my book is that teenage love is the only real love. Um, and almost kind of everything after that first time, you're like, oh my God, I'm in love with this girl. Everything is kind of derivative from that. Right. Um, now, should you let that kind of ruin your life or mold your life? That's a different story. And I, you know, I address that later in the book, but mm -hmm. um, I kind of then get on a kick of like, well, everything in the world is derivative. And I make the joke that I'm derivative. My, <laughs> my style or my writing is derivative from delicious tacos. Um, who, if you're, if you're listening to this, I'm sure you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I was definitely yeah, funny. influenced. I was influenced by tacos, but I kind of make a joke where like, because um, people compared me from day one, from my very first post on Kill to Party. Sorry, I had to grab something here to show you. I, I missed the last bit there. But oh, yes, oh, finally oh. some good news. Yeah. And look at that. Oh my god! That gave me a signed copy. That's awesome. I, read, um, I was on vacation with my family in Costa Rica reading this one. And they're all sitting there having a good time. It's like, what are you reading about? And I'm like, Incel Apocalypse. <laughs> they're like, what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> so from, from day one, people compared me to Delicious Tacos. So mm -hmm. I kind of make a joke like that in my book. Um, so, you know, again, uh, playing, into the theme, playing into the theme of every, everything being derivative from something else. My cover is Casey Anthony, but kind of in the style of his book, The Pussy. And I, I really hope he, that he didn't take offense to that. I know you do have to kind of read the book and furthermore kind of understand the themes of my book to even get the reference. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it is, it is kind of a deep reference to everything being derivative. So if I'm derivative of Delicious Tacos, my first, book is, my first book's cover is derivative of his first book's cover. Well, we're all derivative this way. I was thinking like Neil Strauss is the game. Right. How how is that different than the pussy from tacos? From this from you? Even fuck files from me. They're all kind of like I hate to say it, but we all have like the same like they're different takes, they're different themes, they're different vibes, but it's all like the here's my raw right. life that's not all guts and glamour. It's got warts, right. it's got success and failure. And it's like but even with like the same theme. And it's I, I want to make the equivalent here, like one of us is Star Wars, one of us is Indiana Jones, yeah. one of us is Flash Gordon. Yeah. You know what I mean? But they're we all, all We all definitely serials. took it. We took it in different directions. Um, I, I kind of, um, I, know we, I know we've kind of uh, focused on the dating Manosphere-esque parts of my book, but my other influence was Chuck Cloisterman. I don't know if you're familiar with him. I am not. Okay, Chuck Cloisterman really was the reason I started writing, more so than anything else. He is a culture essay, essay, essayist. Um, he wrote books like, um, what is this? Eating the Dinosaur. I think it's Eating the Dinosaur. Now I'm like losing it. Um, yeah, Eating oh, the Dinosaur. Oh, New York Times writer. Okay, so I think I know what kind of, yeah, a culture writer kind of thing. Culture writer. Um, right, so he writes like essays on pop culture. And um, kind of <laughs> what I was saying before, how like uh, all the tools are in our hands, like to to start being creators on our in our own right. Um, mm -hmm. I had gotten an iPad, so I downloaded like from the Pirate Bay, like a torrent of like twenty thousand books or whatever it is, like every book in like the English language. Yeah. So of course um, you're going to read all of them, <laughs> <laughs> right? So I decided to to finally read some books that I, I, I was aware of, but I wouldn't have actually gone out to buy. And I read, uh, I started reading a Cloisterman book, and there was an essay about comparing Kurt Cobain to David Koresh. And he kind of went at it like a literary analysis. I mean, a little bit written than a college student would have done it. 
Um, definitely with voice and personality. So it was, mm -hmm. it wasn't dry, but I was like, it was just mind blowing. Cause I used to love doing, I, I'm an English and philosophy major. Oh, you know, really? with my, yeah. With my undergrad. So I kind of miss writing, you know, analysis, like literary analysis, but doing it on pop culture meant like I didn't have to spend a whole lot of time reading and dissecting a book. I could just kind of off the top of my head, talk about green day. So, um, yeah, Welcome to Hell is definitely the dating memoir of heartbreak and, you know, raunchy sex stories, warts and all. But I also do a lot of pop culture analysis because I kind of also wanted to be Chuck Klosterman. Yeah, well, I noticed that in the, like I said, the Elizabeth Warren and the Death of MTV section, I think. Uh, oh, yeah. And we had off camera, we had an argument at the beginning here where I was saying, like, Gavin from the art from the band Bush. Pretty sure he was Australian, and you're like, no, I convinced he was British, and I actually looked it up, and it turns out you were right. So I just okay. scratched that question off, and I wrote here like I thought maybe you were thinking about Catherine Wheel back when they and Radiohead were fighting over who gets to be the the Beatles 2.0 for American radio. Radiohead obviously won because who knows who the hell Catherine Wheel is, right? I I don't know her. Yeah. Oh, that's oh, you don't know her. I, I don't know her. Yeah, Catherine Wheel. It's they were the biggest thing for one big hit, and then they just died off. And then it's when Radiohead had just, and just just crushed it. And then they started getting really weird. And they're like, all right, maybe it's not quite the Beatles, but it'll still be good. Right. But anyways, yeah, Bush. Oh, but they called them Bush X in Canada because there's another band called Bush. But I, but I get the pop culture references. Oh, that was what, that was what uh, in your Reddit posts back in the day is what people gave you, were giving you crap for is because. They were like, I came here, like you said, I came here to get a roadmap. How do I get to girls? And you were right. talking about uh, pop culture references. Like, I don't care about some boomers rev uh, revelations about the 90s and that. And I'm just like, and like and I think I, I kind of got into a little bit of a flame war myself because I remember being in that one. And I was just saying something to the effect of it's like, do you understand that like it's fun at some point? Like if you're talking about game, it has to be fun. It's right. Not a game. Right. And so you, the way you can take a guy through a story, and yes, the story, there's a lesson, even though it's not your primary concern, it's at the very least a biography of situations that will happen in your life, most likely, because all of us have generally the same lives. But at the same time, you're not so soft art artistic about it, <laughs> that you can meander your way through it and keep the person interested, which is telling good stories. And what is like a date with a girl other than a chance to tell a bunch of good stories and build some rapport, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um... No, no, it's, so it had a pearls before swine vibe to it. Yeah, if you if you can't be interesting, why why should she be interested? <laughs> I like the way you put it. <laughs> Fuck, I can't believe I had to bring up Catherine Wheel. I haven't talked about those guys since 1998. God. Yeah, the, what they actually reminded me of is that movie Empire Records. Remember the artist they had in there? You the, know, the bad I, guy. I never actually saw that one. Oh, dude, 90s angst. It's like the Gen Xers, like, this is what it was like in college, bro. Right, yeah. right. Anyways, if you ever watch it and you see the main, uh, the, the the villain of the thing, he's basically Catherine Wheel, I would okay. argue. The pretty boy with, like, the, the, what do they call him, like, the suede shirt? <laughs> like, that 90s suede? Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's what I liked about it, because, I mean, yes, I get it, I'm a 90s kid, too. So when I hear you waxing, you know, nostalgically about stuff. I'm like, I can remember this. And then it puts me into that time and place, which really helps. I have no idea how a Zoomer is going to take it, though. I can only imagine what it'd be like when I read stories about guys talking about the Second World War being like the equivalent culturally. Right. Even well, though I'm not saying is... you're not nearly like the Second World War as far as scale. But I'm just saying it was still entertaining. I don't think Zoomers watch movies. I think that's the, I think that's the issue. Outside of like something that you kind of have pay attention to while looking at their phones. Really? So it's just Twitch and YouTube and that's it? Maybe they're the ones watching those hot tub streams that I keep hearing about. <laughs> Welcome to hell. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Do you know about the hot tub streams? I don't know about the hot tub streams. All right. So I'm about to give you like eight years worth of Welcome to Hell posts. So oh, there's wow. this chick. I think it's her name is Amaranth, if I'm not mistaken. No talents whatsoever. And she learned about Twitch. They had like nudity things. You can't be nudity. You can't just, you know, do this and that. So she's like, I'm just going to go into a hot tub and sit in there in a bikini and talk to guys. And then it kind of started to get weird with like the the Belle Daphine things where she'd wear like a horse head in there. Right. And then she started doing ASMR with like the microphone with a condom over top of it. But it was like, anyways, it's basically the equivalent of walking into the, the magazine racks and seeing the porn mag, but it's got the plastic wrapping on it. So you can't just skim through it while you're, while you're looking. So you have to get Maxim instead. 
Okay. A bunch of 90s references for you there. Yeah, it was like that. So yeah, look into Amaranth and the hot tub streams, and you're gonna have so many welcome to hell posts. You're, you're gonna you're gonna love it. You'll sell thousands of books just off of that alone. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to do some googling when we when we get off. All right. Uh, my next question then. So you were talking about delicious tacos, kind of like uh, the fanboy post, which one of the essays. It's actually one of my questions in here too. Something I noticed that either I do it bad or you do it well. I'm assuming okay. a bit of both, but authors for some reason carry beef really quickly like i know just by mentioning i was writing a book i had two authors block me and i had to find out about because i actually liked reading their work i won't say who but you seem to have been like well received and well liked among the writer community now i don't know what it is you do different but how do you do that keep keep authors from having any sort of professional jealousy and it's more just like positive and like helpful i guess back lack of a better word well, I think that I'm not necessarily competing with anyone. I think that I have my own style. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the, again, the Manosphere guys, um, I think a lot of them are oh, selling. Man, I'm, not, I'm not talking Manosphere guys. I'm talking about just like author oh, really? guys you'd see on there. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Like writer writers. Nothing to do with this stuff. <sighs> I don't know, man. Um, the the uh, little, I mean, it's we have a little niche right now called alt lit and mm -hmm. um there there aren't so many names in it and i think the names that are that are writing currently in it uh there was recently an article in unheard that named me among four people you had hmm. you know you have uh, tacos you have zero hp and bap and i was very very pleased to to be named among them there are of course other people writing but yeah. Uh, I don't think right now it's about jealousy. I think right now it's about building something, which is um, awesome. I think I think it's I think it's great. I think that uh, it's going to be ginormous in five years. I think in five years that we will we will be the the cool kids. We will be the punk rockers, and I think people are going to really <laughs> really pick up on this. Oh, this reminds me. What was that guy's name? He keeps blocking everybody. Lindy something. Oh, uh, Paul Scalias. Paul Skellius, yes, yes. How he just got he got his New York Times uh, right. blurb there a little while ago, and everybody was like, "Oh, this is it. He's going big time." I have no idea what happened out of it because he's blocked me and unblocked me so much I can never follow his stuff. Which I don't know if that's his intent or he just hates how I, you know, dunk on everything. But I hear that from a lot of people that he blocks and unblocks. Um, I, I don't I don't get the appeal with him. I know he came up with that term, Lindy. I guess mm -hmm. he came up with that. I I still don't really know what it means, but. Oh. <laughs> Do you want to know? I had I asked the same question like a year ago. I finally got an answer. I would I would love to know. Uh, it was and I uh, it was when so something that used to be good that lasted till today has like six hundred years of history on the printed press, right? So it's more likely that that is going to continue to be good because it's got the track record. As opposed to something that's brand new and is life changing. So when something is old and most likely going to continue going on, you say that that's Lindy, which for me I just like it's staying power. But I mean whatever you throw a catchy term on it. But yeah, it's interesting because you mentioned that because he's same as you guys, like uh, like a like cultural writer, kind of niche. And then all of a sudden, just like one mainstream rag kind of got a hold of it and then it yeah. just boosted them. And that's all it really would take, I guess, for anyone. I mean, BAP technically already got that, but that's a that's a story and a half. How's he, ta how's he doing, by the way? I haven't talked to him since they removed him from Twitter for, I don't know, too much Trump or something. I can't even, I don't remember what the justification was. <laughs> I think the justification was, I don't know if I'm allowed to tell people this, but I heard. Oh, maybe from, don't then. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, just rule violations that just petty, petty nonsense. Just, uh. just a reason to get rid of someone that's kind of hated by the, by the regime. Um, I don't, I, I haven't, I'm not really friends with him. Um, I've had a few interactions with him. He's aware of me. He very nicely gave me like a little, little nudge when I first put the book out. He uh, tweeted, tweeted about it, which got, you know, kind of got me a, 500 800 followers immediately um when he still had his account of course although his new account is up to like pre pretty pretty good numbers oh, um, nice. i didn't want to name drop it because i know they say ban evasions a thing so i'm just like if you find it you find it if you don't you don't. exactly yeah 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 so yeah but his 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 new account's doing pretty well but um the last i heard was he he uh at some point this year is going to put out bronze age mindset too Oh really? Bronze Age Mindset is, I believe, considered the best-selling independent nonfiction book of all time. 
really it's done that well it's done that well it's it's like look up its ranking on any given day and it's phenomenal my god that was good for him that's funny too when it came out i'm like awesome another author doing a thing same way i'd like reached out to you i'm like this is great man so psyched and he's like thanks yeah no he's, <laughs> meanwhile he's... you look in the background he's like thanks i'm about to do harry potter 7 <laughs> oh that's funny no he's super cool he's he's super cool he's i've never heard a bad thing that anyone would have to say like he to any account that reached out to him he would be friendly yeah Oh, guaranteed. Um, yeah, you hear a lot of hate about him, but it's never it's never on a personal level. It seems almost like an ideological one. And considering the group that you were just talking about there, you've avoided all of that, which is also impressive in and of itself. Like nobody has tried to use you as their like villain in their own brand marketing, which I don't know if that was a conscious decision or you're kind of worried about it or what? Like, what do you think? Is it just you're too damn likable or is it the Chevy Chase thing or what? Um. Do you mean like people from our sphere turning on me or no, people no, no, from the not outside? there. Any, any sphere, like, any uh, sphere. you know, feminists aren't coming after you and mainstream press isn't coming after you like bronze age playboy, political wonks. And a lot of like jealous conservative authors were like going after him hard because of that. And it's like a professional jealousy thing that I'm, I've been an author my whole life and he comes in and just happy Gilmore's this shit. But you <laughs> like, and considering you're in that same kind of grouping, I would have expected some of that on you, but you've managed to avoid all of it too. Like I said, it's just, you don't fit the mold of what I would expect from an author of your caliber with your social media presence. You know what I'm, you know what I'm trying to get at here? Um, yeah. And I don't know if like, do you even know, or is it just like, I don't know, just have not my turn yet. Well, I, <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to think <laughs> that. So, um, no, it's just that, I, I, you know, I think that, um, authenticity goes a long way with people. And mm -hmm. I think, um, I was kind of, I, I wrote a Twitter thread that I spent so much time on just punching away on my phone that went nowhere because that happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, there are, there are three types of accounts that I, the way I see Twitter, you have your content account, which is like the easiest way to get popular, but it's the most restrictive. Like this is an account where you don't even have any inkling of who's behind it. Like a lot of masculinity accounts are like this, like alpha mindset. Oh um, boy. <laughs> then you have a, right. And you know, and, and it, they're good for what they are. If you're looking for that kind of content, they're, they're right there for you. Um, <laughs> then you have guys who are doing a brand where mm -hmm. they are, they're front and center, but you, by following them, 90% of their posts are going to be on topic for what you're looking for. That's a little more difficult than a content account, but kind of along the same line, except you, the author is part of it. Right. And then there are the cult of personality accounts where you kind of have the freedom to tweet about whatever you want and people love you for it. And that's the hardest account to get in motion, but it's the biggest payoff. So it's going to be the slowest to build, but you're going to get the biggest return from it. Um, I consider... I consider Delicious Tacos a cult of personality. I'm not following him to learn anything. He's not necessarily, like, he's tweeting his thoughts as they happen in real time. That's what I want. I want Delicious Tacos thoughts. So I've tried to kind of model myself on, I don't want to feel ever restricted to keeping on brand, keeping on to a topic. I want to kind of give my thoughts as they come. Maybe you'll care. Like today I tweeted about crayons. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, oh right takes. i remember this one you were saying that yeah, they, they have a crayon monopoly but yeah. on the same thought have you ever tried to use a non-crayon from non-crayola and it's like they're shit <laughs> they're shit they're shit so it's like crayola deserves their monopoly but i mean it, really no other brand could step up and make a quality crayon like kind of you know there's more questions asked than answered there you know what i like about that though that's it's uh it sums up twitter to a t it's irreverent but it's just smart enough to make you feel like you could win a Jeopardy round off of it. <laughs> it seems that most of Twitter is that everybody who's like, everybody wants to be very smart and have these very smart takes, but they always, for anybody who knows what they're talking about, 90% of them sound just like you said, horribly uninformed and just kind of running your mouth for the sake of it. But right, that, just making content. Yeah, but there's a self-awareness. You call it authenticity. I'll call it self-awareness. A self-awareness that you understand that game and then you can play it. I think that's what makes your, your Twitter enjoyable to read, which most Twitter accounts are not enjoyable to read. Like those masculinity ones you talk about, oh. they're my welcome to hell. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'm like, how, how did Don Draper, a thread, one out of 63, and at the end, gumroad courses, the semen retention, and what a semen okay, so, letter. 
I'm gonna. Um, I'm not a shit talker. I'm really not. But there's this one account. Yeah. That yeah. I saw it and I was like, this is this is the end. Like <laughs> this is the like like uh, you, you've seen Boogie Nights, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so like Dirk Diggler like kind of represents like like the like like porno innocence, if that could even be a thing, where like he has actual passion, and they replace him later on with with the like fake Dirk Diggler, and all of that is gone, right? He's just like this like soulless kind of going through the motions. Yeah, a woodsman. Yeah, so um, I just feel like that's where we are with the manosphere, where we have these like clowns and jokers. Um, kind of like pretending rather than rather than Roosh that I think brought a lot of authenticity to it. Yeah. What, so, what's the what's the quote? First is tragedy, then is farce. Exactly. <laughs> did I just quote Karl Marx? Yes. Yes, I did. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I don't know. If, I mean, did is Roosh's life a tragedy? I mean, that's a different. That's a different. Oh, no, I just mean I mean the themes there. Roosh. I don't want to just start. Trust me. If you start asking about Roosh, I'll go off for like an hour, and I don't want to do that to you. Okay. I like it too much for that, but I agree. You watch it all. It's, it's, it's like, uh, it's like they took the skin, their older brother's skin and just put it on and like, eh, this will work. So this account that I saw and I was just like, I, I can never, I can never tell people I'm part of the Manos forever again. The masculine geek. Are you aware oh. of this person? I, if you're, if he's a friend, I apologize. No, please do. Please do. Masculine geek. That's funny. The masculine <laughs> geek. And, um, I, I the, the the post I saw of his was is is uh he was he was trying to you know hype Rolo which is cool you know you have to do a certain amount of ass kissing to bigger accounts it's just the way life is so he's sitting there with the rational male book and in like in the frame in at his feet is a, is a woman and I think I don't exactly remember she may have a ball gag in and mm -hmm. she's rubbing his feet and he puts a watermark over this because. In case you want to pretend to be a masculine geek, you know, he's going to stop you. So, right, he has, his, he has his little Twitter handle on it in case you want to steal his picture. And, like, this is this has become, this is the manosphere now. And I oh, just. That's ugh. funny. I didn't even know that one. Uh, yeah, because it reminds me of, uh, there was another one. Like, there's a, there, did you know there's, like, a Muslim manosphere, too? <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's weird because they're not. So I have a couple guys that, you know, I met through this space that are great. They like live in Saudi Arabia and like, like Middle East. The ones that are mostly bragging about like Muslim masculinity have like moved to Europe or to like Toronto or something like that. And they're talking about how they want six wives, even though it's completely illegal here. And that was <laughs> the, the post you're talking about. I'm going to take a guess. It was likely around that time that they were doing these things where they would get pictures of their wives in full hijab tying their shoes for them. Like very like submissive, demeaning stuff to say, basically like we got our women on lock better than you, and that was kind of like the big flex for a good month there. Oh, maybe. And I got the feeling he was from, he was like a mashup of the BDSM community. Well, that too. Like there's there's the there's a bunch of these guys, and some of them are the BDSM thing. So this was kind of like a back and forth flex between them. Absolute cringe. I don't know if the MG guys had the same self awareness that you do on this, so I don't want to vouch for it. But yeah, the whole thing, I I 100% agree. That's where I started. Like we usually ask questions. I'm like, what the hell? Why are you here? To anybody who's in like the <laughs> manosphere, because it's like if you're here to get famous, you pick the most unattractive place to do that. <laughs> so clearly, you've made a horrible mistake at some point. Which I guess is my question to you: Why the hell are you in this space? Why okay. are you here? <laughs> okay, I mean, it's it really it really started out so innocently. Um, I sometimes when you're introduced to new things on the internet that you like mm -hmm. become addicted to, you ask yourself like, what was I even doing on my phone before this? Um, <laughs> it's, it's a funny thing. So this, this girl that I was talking to from, okay, not okay, Cupid, plenty of fish. I had oh. been single for less than a year um, from a relationship that was four and a half years long. I cover mm -hmm. this in the book, this girl that I called her Marissa. Um, I was with her for, four and a half years and you you know it's like um it's like uh i think louis ck called relationships that end being in a shitty prison and it really is like you like you're you're part of the real world but like you're like kind of kept away from you know certain aspects of it like <laughs> like having to you know try to try to fuck women try to date women so anyway so I, i'm released from my little prison um, it's like, I really felt this rush of like having a jailbreak, whatever. So mm -hmm. I, I'm talking to this girl from, from Plenty of Fish and she, she says, you know, she's a Redditor 
you know, she she's sending me, she wants me to be on Reddit. So she's sending me these different <laughs> posts from Reddit. Like, I think like, um, she tried Look, to get me narwhals from- and bacon. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how to use Reddit, obviously. So I click on this list of like, I think I thought you browse like a list of all the subreddits and you pick out what you're interested in. And that's how you set it up, which oh. is so funny. Cause like, that's so not how you set it up. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, I, fi- I find the red pill. And it's on this list, which I find really strange, but it said how it's a space for men to kind of talk about, I don't know about the problems, but a space to talk about male issues. Yeah. And I do remember my gut response to that was like, why would men even need that? Which is like, so to think, to think I thought that where I was in my life at the time is fucking crazy. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's really crazy for me to think like, well, let's see, I, I, I don't have a job. Like, yeah. you know, like, like I was just like, not in a good place. So like my last relationship blew up in my face over the course of many years for when I was just trying to treat her as, as, as I thought, you know, you fight, you should. Like, yeah. So I was, I was going through the motions of like what I thought life should be just with mainstream advice. So I find the red pill and I mean, that's, that's it. You know, a lot of, a lot of the stuff made sense to me immediately. Um, Stuff that I, I suspected or, or I observed on my own that no one in my my real life would, you know, they would just think I'm an asshole for, for pointing out or understanding. And I would be like, how does anyone else not see this stuff? You know, and I think a lot of men who, who do find the red pill or the manosphere feel that immediately where that they're in a space where finally other people are, are kind of confirming these suspicions they had about how the world worked. Yeah. I, oh, I 100% agree. It's funny because back when you were writing, I was actually one of the moderators at the time, too. Okay. So I remember this. Like, yeah, you got tons of reports. And there was, like, such a those vitriolic hail. And I kind of got a good laugh at about them. I've since left. But I agree. It's, like, it's never, oh, wow, this is completely new. I've never heard of this before. It's always, like you said, about 50 to 80% of it. You're like, no, that makes sense. I've never thought about it that way. And then there's that extra little 20% that makes everything click, which was kind right. of interesting. Right, but, definitely. And here was, here was the point I was getting at this, which I hope you don't mind if I fluff you again here. No, please. I, I tend to do that when guys, I enjoy their company, but <laughs> when people find their way here, our place, whatever, talking about this stuff, I find there's two types. There is guys who do it because they think they can be the coolest kid in the He-Man Woman Haters Club. And there's guys that find their way here by accident. <laughs> Clary and I have talked about this a bunch, and it's just so much fun. The act, the guys who find their way here by accident are so much more engaging and so much more fun. And case in point, because like you have a life experience outside right. of, of all the talking points, right? That's and all exactly the, the, it. The, the, the memes and that. So when you come in here, you're not just going to do, because everybody has the same posts. If you're a blogger and you're writing in the Manosphere, they're not going to write, you know, Adventureland or Bamboozled or Kill the Party. They're going to write seven ways to to be more alpha sprinkle a little alpha on your life or um six reasons she cheated on you and they make these goofy lists. Or, or they're gonna write about when she comes home pissing all over her <laughs> oh, <laughs> on geez. the porch <laughs> oh i i've managed to avoid that entire story because i'm like funny enough about 50 to 80 percent of that stuff i'm already guessing i know because i actually had sailors that i used to sail with who's like how did you meet your wife? And now he's like, oh, well, we were on high five. And like, how'd you meet yours? And it's like, well, I, I picked her up one night drunk and then I peed her bed or something like that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and then as soon as I started hearing that one, I'm like, I bet you that's where this stuff is going. Oh, I don't want to know. Do I want to know? Is it good? Or is it just like, I'm thinking pretty, yeah. pretty bad. Right. Oh, it is bad. <laughs> oh no. I was, I, I was, I was, I was making fun of our, our, our old buddy, Jack. I don't, I don't oh, know. that part. Oh man. Cause she in that in that infamous blog post that he you know that ruined his life um she goes out on her tinder date and like she, like he does the i mean i don't believe this part whatsoever he's just doing the like i'm rec- you know reclaiming frame or wh- whatever it is oh. so he part of the, the end of i don't blame you for not getting to this because this post is like five thousand words like he's not a great writer um <laughs> She gets back and, and he takes her outside and pisses all over her, supposedly. But that's totally like, if you know he's coming from that manosphere perspective, that's his way of like reclaiming the frame, you know? So Dude, it's like he doesn't can, look like a total cuck. I, I can totally understand. So I don't know if you know, I actually know Jack Murphy and I'm like with you on this. So here's the thing, what he was trying to articulate 
and why it's so cringe. First off, that article isn't why he had like his horrible situation. His horrible situation was because he went on to Blaze TV right. with uh, Sydney Watson. And she asked about it from some joke leaving a $5 super chat. Right. Which I've since memed into like the $5 super chat career ender. That's, <laughs> so if you see a $5 super chat in your live streams, just leave it. Just don't touch it. <laughs> So what he was trying to do was he had one itis. One I like you're fixated on your girl, you're going to do yeah. anything for her and then you're just like you're too clingy and it doesn't work out well. So he's like I okay. got to figure out how to get past this. He's not the first guy to talk about this uh, uh one of the Tates, I can't remember which one. They're the same to me, but they said the same thing. It's like if you're ever worried about getting one itis for a girl, make her a cam whore for a bit. Then you'll get over that jealousy. So in like a weird, twisted way, I can see what he was trying to do. He's like, I need to make sure that I don't get too many feelings to this girl till I be clingy and smother it. So I'm going to open up the relationship and I'm going to send her on a Tinder gate to go get slammed. Now, whether that's the real example or whether that's the uh, the what you tell your buddies to sound cool. Right. That's how he explained it to me. And I'm like, <sighs> it reminds me of the lesson. Do you know the kind of kid who's like dad beat mom? And then he grows up to be like, and I'm never going to touch my wife like that ever. Yeah. So dad technically taught him a lesson, but you can't really take credit for being a good teacher. <laughs> I kind of have that same thread and I wish I could wordsmith it better. So yeah, that was that part there. But the part that makes me think, and this is why I like you, because you didn't come from this space. So you don't have the jargon or like you wouldn't have even thought of like the pissing on girls thing. Right. It's because when anybody brings that up, he's like too ashamed to talk about it. Like he's he's willing to talk about it when it when it's good for his brand. But he's then when so it comes dumb. to having if a real authentic it, conversation, yeah. Dude, if he explained it how you just explained it to me, I, I think that people would just have accepted it and moved on. I told him that. <laughs> I have I sat there in a room, stared at him. This was like in 2018. I was in Florida and I told him about this thing. And he's like, this thing keeps coming back to haunt me. I'm like, all you have to do is own it, man. Like, I get it. And he's I'm like, look, you you were married. You had kids. You raised the kids. Like, all the, the traditional, conservative, like, Christian man. You've done it all. And you're done. And it's over there. And now you can be a complete degenerate, like, piss lord over here. Right. And nobody can. And you can be like, what? What do you want me to do? Have another family and raise them to adulthood? Like, I've done everything. <laughs> now I'm living for me. But, yeah, I just never went there. And it's funny because, like, I've never... Everybody I've talked to has kind of known that stuff. So to see your side coming at it from like a, an outside side, it's actually super interesting. And I'm so glad you don't know these stories because then when I read your writing, I know it's not going to be tainted by nonsense. <laughs> it's actually like the thoughts and the artistic flair of, a, of an individual man. It's funny because like an individual story and it'll resonate, but it's not going to it's not going to it's not going to resonate like because it's the same story for it 500 times, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I just, I mean, in my time, not, not for, not for a while, but I did read a lot of red pill stuff and I've never come across the theory of sending your woman to fuck someone else. It's just so bizarre to me. Like I get it. It's like, somewhere I, in the back. It's in the back. <laughs> as, you, as you've, as, as you've explained it, I understand the logic, but it's still like, so I don't yeah, know. There's I, a better way to achieve that. I think. <laughs> Yes, there's a better way to achieve that. <laughs> I'm trying to be tactful here. <laughs> oh, the but, the but the best part of that whole thing, and I know we're not talking about the book, so I'm going to swing back to it after that. The best part about it is that he had a lot of audience of like disenfranchised traditional conservative men that loved him and loved his book, uh, The Democrats Deplorable. Like guys right. who loved Obama, now they went to Trump because they felt left out. And there was a good solid six month period where they were all getting to watch gay porn with impunity. No, no, no. It's because of this media brand that I follow in my limitable order. I got to look up all this research to find out all these things that make me mad. And it's definitely not me just looking up homoerotic, hetero, flexible porn and oh, enjoying God. myself. And it was like, at this point, nobody really made this point, but I've been laughing silently. You're the first guy I've told about it. It's made me laugh for like the longest time. And that's another reason. So when I see your stories, you're talking about, yeah, these depressing stories, welcome to hell. And I'm just going... No, no, you're not like it can get so much worse, but that's because you show a glimmer of self-awareness in a lot of these stories. And so you can kind of you pull yourself back from the abyss and then you make yourself a normal, functioning, somewhat happy man. Yeah. And like so you're like, if anything, the the 
alter ego of Jack. Like the alter, like you know, in movies, you give him the black gloves and a turtleneck, and you're the evil v- v- version of something. Right, right, right. You're like the Jack Murphy with a turtleneck and a goatee now, and then you don't <laughs> piss on your wife. You know? oh, God. <laughs> Which I think is the highest praise a man can really shoot for in life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've done something right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, a little ahead of schedule. So this point, I was just going to ask you to run your mouth about some of your essays, the ones I found most curious. So I'm going to start rattling off some names here, and I want to hear... Try to tell me something that I wouldn't know just from like a read through on it. And the first okay. one is, yeah, Elizabeth Warren and the death of MTV. And I'll start from this. I The main point I took from it was back in the day before the Internet, there was a zeit, like a zeitgeist, I think they call it. So everybody watched the same things. If uh, Nirvana was playing a yeah. concert on Friday, everybody was talking about it on Monday. And so everybody was on the same page. Pop culture was on the same page. And now that it's super balkanized nobody has any way to relate to other people. And that's kind of what I took from it. So like, please tell me some stuff that I'm missing in there. That's super interesting. Um, so the way I write essays is that mm-hmm. um, I like kind of getting inside the head of a, of a song, like to, to really get at the theme of a song and then write an essay based on that theme. Mm-hmm. Um, what the fruit the the that essay is based on the song uh, the REM song What's the Frequency Kenneth, which was mm. their single from their 1995 album Monster. Um, What's the Frequency Kenneth is about someone who doesn't get it, um, someone who like doesn't get how to be cool. Like you could see someone else doing it, and you just don't understand what what the deal is. And this was around the time Elizabeth Warren was on a live stream um, trying to be AOC. And I, I, that's oh, how yeah, I... yeah, she was drinking beer and whatever, she right? She was drinking beer because AOC does these... I don't know if she does anymore. She was doing these live streams where... I mean, they're just as phony, don't get me wrong, where she's mm-hmm. like making macaroni and cheese and like, I'm just sitting in my PJs talking. You know, I'm so real, you. <laughs> and I mean, they're fake, but she could pull it off. Like, I, I, believe, I believe it as much as I'm going to believe any politician. Right. And then you had Elizabeth Warren doing, trying to do the same thing where she goes, I'm going to get me a beer. And like, she doesn't talk that way. And everyone called her out for it. And <laughs> I just think about the, the jealousy she must have, especially moving forward as AOC kind of is heading toward eventually becoming the president. I mean, I think we all kind of see that coming. And I think Elizabeth Warren's never going to get that chance. I really, really doubt it. I think her time came and went. Um, so I feel like it's, it's that, it's that, uh, what's the frequency Kenneth kind of theme where she's on the outside shouting, you know, what's the frequency Kenneth? <laughs> I wish I was a bigger REM fan too. Cause I might've caught up on that. I, is Canada, are, we had the tragically hip, which is basically Canada's REM. So okay, I, it's actually, thank you. So you're teaching me the American one here. All you right, know, so. R- REM is highly recommended. I think I'm going to make, um, when I make my own YouTube channel and start doing my own live streaming, um, I think I'm going to make a playlist for Welcome to Hell that kind of includes all the songs I reference. Ooh. Well, here's my question. And so my second one with Better to Rain in Hell, what okay. song did you use to have Star Wars and fake tits on a 40-year-old come together? <laughs> <laughs> okay. This one, and I hate to say it. I, I didn't take anything from it other than, like, don't buy your own, don't buy into the hype so much, like a kayfabe. Like the story is the story. Don't take it too seriously. But, but it was more one of those ones that I just enjoyed the journey as I read through the chapter here. So this is one I'm actually like really curious on. So I think people want to hear, want you to lie to them. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think for, uh, (laughs) after I was red pilled, um, (laughs) you know, I, I don't know if you, I don't know if you maybe have the same experience. I've definitely heard this from other men that, you, you get red-pilled and your game actually gets shitty for, for a while because now you're in your own head. Now, like, what, what, what came naturally to you is your second-guessing and that little split second of a delay ruins it. So um, I, I went on this. Oh, and the other problem is you, once you're red-pilled, that's what you want to talk about. And you, <laughs> what, what better, you know, idea than to talk about it with the women you want to date? So... <laughs> I would have these conversations about like the true nature of love and the true nature of dating and how this all works. And women don't want to hear that. Women don't care. No. Um, and uh, it, 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 <laughs> it struck me when I was talking to an older woman, this was like, 
I think early in the pandemic, um, I was talking to an, uh, a woman over 40. She was attractive to mm -hmm. her credit. Um, and she had, you know, breast implants, which, you know, in itself is, is a lie. Right. And she had told me that she, she likes fuck boys because she likes how they talk to her. Right. And that, that kind of struck me as like, I, I, you know, I kind of am acknowledging that I like bullshit, but I, I, I still like it. Like it's almost self-aware, but not, not quite there yet. Um, and I kind of started thinking about how, um, mythology is used in, you know, in, in fake mythology is kind of used in advertising right. and Lucas built those original, I, mean, I know you're a star Wars fan, right? <laughs> of course. The yeah. originals. Yeah. Yeah. The originals, but, uh, not, so no, no prequels. No, nothing past the first three. Okay. Cause Lucas, a big part of the, the advertising for the prequels was Lucas building a mythology around the prequels. And that became as important as the, the product you were getting. So what, what was in the, the big story around when the prequels came out was that, no, 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 this wasn't the story of Luke Skywalker. This, the whole time, has been the story of Darth Vader. And that was pure bullshit. But mm -hmm. he had to kind of create this backstory. It wasn't good enough to say, well, here's episode one. Here's the movie. Go watch it. He needed to create something larger than all of the movies as a means to sell the movie. Um, I think I referenced Kiss in that piece. Kiss put out the record Alive. Um, that was their first hit record. And it was really just done in a studio like all of their other records. It was a fake live record. Mm -hmm. But that's the one that took off. People kind of want bullshit. And if it's enjoyable bullshit, nobody cares if it's real or not. So that brings it back to liking fuckboys, right? You... I, I feel like the term fuckboy implicitly is that you know you're being bullshit. You know you're being lied to. But is, if the lie is more exciting, who cares? It's funny. I always think of it in a more positive way. I've actually used the term kayfabe a lot. You know, kayfabe, like where you sure. present theater as if it's real. And it's yeah. because we're wrestling fans. And so I think it's one of those things that at least our generation or anybody who's a fan of wrestling now intuitively understands. Like he's not actually the ultimate warrior. And that's not really Hulk Hogan. And he didn't try to steal Elizabeth from Macho Man. Right. But you're like, I'm just going to suspend disbelief because it's so damn entertaining and engaging. I don't mind if I'm lied to. You know? Which is, like, we had an argument. Do you remember this argument? We had it, I think, I want to say, like, two years ago. Okay. About Hollywood Hulk Hogan. <laughs> Do you remember this? Um, so I, Vaguely, yeah. I know. I just remember you're a, the biggest Hulkster fan I think I've ever met. <laughs> Dude. My brother and I, we had a belt, we had the t-shirt, we had everything, like with the rips and everything. And I remember, cause you were, you're a fan of Hollywood Hogan and yes. I hate Hollywood Hogan right. because that's not who Hulk, Hulk Hogan is like Superman. He is America. He is eat your Wheaties and positivity. And he's like surrogate for everything that you hold as good and wholesome. And then, <laughs> but I think that's what you liked is that he did that heel turn it's like yeah. i was the best and you guys turned it's like we lost vietnam god damn it <laughs> and i hated that because it was kind of like just saying the last like my entire wrestling fandom has just been a lie and now right. he hates me and i'm like i didn't leave you man you left me and this is totally this is totally what i remember now yeah you're, you're like the only person that didn't like spark a new interest in wrestling that turned you off from wrestling yeah, it totally turned me off. That's, it's that's it's so like you, it's exactly like you said with the forty year old with the tits. It's yeah. like I want you to be a fuck boy because that is fun. I know you're not a real fuck boy. That's why I dropped the hint. So just tell me what I want to hear, and right. I'll give you what you want to see. And trust me, these things are real, even if even though they feel hard <laughs> as a rock. But at the very least, even though, and you're probably like me, where it's like great to look at, not the best mouth feel. That's that's kind of my impression <laughs> of fake fake tits. Okay. Is that is that a fair assessment, or do you think I, I'm a little off on this one? Yeah, I don't know. I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> but I, I never, I never, I never even got to see him. She, oh, she, that's... she ghosted me before I got the nude. So, oh, I know that's. I save that because that's the, that's one of the last questions I got for you. I know exactly where you're going with that one. <laughs> oh, it's funny. <laughs> oh yeah, guys, listen to the very end because there's a absolutely funny follow up to this bit here. Okay. But, but, but yeah, but that's the thing. And this is why, like, so when you were saying like the experience made things worse, you want to talk to girls about it. Mine was a little bit different 
only because I was like ass deep in like mystery. Like I got the mystery DVDs and stuff like that. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was in the military at the time in the Navy and we were sailing about 180 days a year. So that's 24, seven, 365, half my year's gone and I'm still working full time the half a year I'm here. And every time I went out to date, I, you know, do this, like you said, the standard stuff that we all kind of thought you're supposed to do. And then we'd hit it off and it's like, by the way, I'm going to be back in three months. So, hey, we should grab a coffee. And I'd never hear from anybody again. So I'm like, either I'm jerking off in my living room or I got to figure out something faster. And that's how these ones came to my doorstep. So for me, it was mostly just like means to an end. How can I most efficiently use my time, my very scant time I have to get somewhere with it? And then once, like you said, same thing, red pill for me, it was, I was already in a relationship. So for me, it was more uh, how it... Like, everybody notices this. I know I'm kind of rambly on here, so bear with me. I'm, it's supposed to be about you, and I'm talking about me. I apologize for that, but... Do everybody... Do you, have you ever noticed this one, too, where everybody, like, I took the pill, and now I'm better with women or whatever, even after your growing pains. But then you start to notice you see it in other things. So, for example, when you want to negotiate a raise with your boss, or you're having a, an interview with somebody else, and you're treating it, you're like, hey, it's weird. The same game... Like, I'm not doing the cube on the HR person... But it's the same rapport building. Right. And instead of seduction, it's like, but yeah, you notice this and people were like, everybody for some reason makes like 25% more at their job was my experience. Every guy I ever talked to, me included. It seems that like you're leaving money on the table by not being attractive. And then just by learning to sleep with girls, you're like, this carries over into so many other parts of my life. Absolutely. I mean, heck, it got you into a, it made you into an author, technically, <laughs> your formative experiences. Yep. Ab absolutely. Um, yeah. I don't remember what I was going with that. Uh Say some things that make sense to tie to that. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the, I mean, the skills in charming people are universal. And yeah, um, I mean, I think for most guys who, who are in our space, it's like you got to learn to be a little less autistic. And I, I don't say <laughs> autistic in any kind of like... No, I think you're not being I, pejorative. You're talking about it in a clinical sense. Y yeah, well, I mean, like, I mean, these guys are brilliant. You know, I think, I think autism is... Um, in a way, a, a great benefit to, to, you know, your life. <laughs> but if you could kind of like get it in check, then you're, then now, now you're really rolling. And I think that's really the, the real lesson of the manosphere for these guys is just to kind of have some normal person, social skills, yeah. you know, keep, keep the autism, you know, do, do what you're doing with it, whatever, you know, however, well, like it's like, yours. You don't need to share it with the world. <laughs> Be selfish yeah. with it. But like, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, let's say you became a doctor because you're you're able to focus that much because of your mm -hmm. autism. That's awesome. But yeah, you gotta you gotta learn to to charm people, and that's that's definitely the you know, the core lesson of the manosphere of like something you're actually not just theory that's going to depress you, but stuff that you're going to kind of take and put into use is is to learn to be charming. And that's and that's why I love this one. This is why is why I brought up this one here because like okay. the little bits I was reading on it, I got that impression. So you could just tell a guy that hey, be more charming, be socially savvy. You know, don't be overly literal. Don't explain how smart you are because of these things you learned because you read, you know, half of a, a Rouge post from 2012. <laughs> and you're, but, but you can just say that and the guy will like nod his head and then you'll go out and do it anyway because he doesn't understand. But like you go through this and you're showing the guy who kind of like was given all the hints not to do that and then still screwed it up. So I think it's a stronger lesson because the guy has to actually use that, you know, great intelligence of his autism to kind of put that fact together himself. And I, I, I want to equate it to special forces training. My friend of mine, we're Canadians. We have uh, Sartex, clearance divers, JTF2, Army, Navy, Air Force ones. My, I've had a couple friends that go through the clearance diver course, which is absolutely brutal. Hell week. Two weeks of like no sleep, constantly diving underwater, shreds your skin to ground beef. They look like dead men walking. But at the end of that course, their training is actually much easier, but they become so very proud of what they've done because they had to earn it, you know? Yeah. And that's what I liked about this is that you're, you're making the reader earn it. You don't insult their intelligence. You don't okay. be overly literal because you don't think they're able to understand subtext. You're like, here it is. But you're not even trying to do it. I guess it's the effortlessness that comes with it too that I also enjoy. I've been fluffing you a lot. Well, I guess this whole thing is about you. So, I mean, it's probably the best time to fluff you, right? <laughs> hey, there's always a good time for that. Um, <laughs> no, that's, I, I've, I've thought about that a lot. Um, how much you want to explain. And there's definitely a balance because if sometimes you don't connect the dots, they're just going to be lost. So, I mean, that's, that's like kind of the journey of becoming a writer. 
the journey of editing, you know, um, I, I'm still growing. And I think, I think anyone serious about writing is, is always growing. So these are kind of the things you think about as you're putting in your 10,000 hours of mastery, you know, mm. um, how, you know, how much do you give, how much do you hold back on and let the, let the reader kind of hopefully figure it out? You know, I don't know, but yeah, sometimes you don't want to, you don't want to kind of dumb it down. You want to hopefully someone, again, you're painting a picture, the, the, the viewer, the reader takes what they're going to take. Yeah. Well, isn't that the, isn't that the thing about uh, the subjective critique of art is that once you put it out there, the other person is going to, going to have a subjective experience that you have no control over. Yeah, definitely. Just hopefully I mean, nobody takes this and goes, yeah, I think I'm going to do a Roman McClay on the world here or an Alec Minnesan. I don't oh, think, no, I don't think they're going to get there. I'm just kidding. I, I love, I love the comments where they act like I like don't <laughs> like, um, Again, I'm not the necessarily always the hero, or ever the hero, if you want to look at it like that. And sometimes no, you're the people protagonist. are going to right, but sometimes people are going to make comments like, "Oh, he doesn't get that." Like, what he's saying is stupid. Here, it's like, of course I do. <laughs> like, that's the point. <laughs> like, I want really? you to be able to make that comment. So I got what I wanted because I want the reader to have a response. Mm -hmm. And that's the good thing, because that's because then you talk about how you don't want to dumb it down, but then there's the flip side where guys. And you can, I don't know how you do it, but I can see it through how they write, where they just want you to know how smart they are. And oh, I'm going to bring up Sanction again, because okay. this is what turned me off from his book, which is the exact opposite of yours. His first chapter was basically saying, I'm not smart enough to understand this. And I'm like, why is this first chapter, and this is after like 15 Nietzsche quotes, by the way. Oh, man. Basically saying that I'm too stupid to be able to read this book. And you couldn't understand possibly what he went through and why it took him 3,000 words to get there. And Nick August, he was, he's the one who helped me edit my book. He's actually a great writer, too. He did helped with uh, Punch Riot Magazine. I don't right. know if you've ever seen that one. No, I'm familiar with him, though. I think we're mutuals. Oh, yeah. Same thing. Like, we've talked. He's talked about uh, your book with me, too, and kind of enjoyed it. I think he's he's a big fan of when books have a voice. Okay. And that's the other thing. So, like, nobody could write your book. Right. And that's the part that gives it a voice. If, if, if This is mostly for the audience's sake. Like, it doesn't mean that the grammar is always correct. Not always going to be. It will be in the things that you find important. Maybe some mm -hmm. things are not. But it's readable and you can understand it. And even the parts that may not be grammatically perfect give it a certain character. Yes. But the fact that you're, like, aware of this and it's consistent character, you can tell that it's, like, a purposeful choice. Yes. It's just one yeah. of those little things I enjoy. I don't know. Voice, voices, um, voices, I, I think, among the most important. Like, I always tell people, work on their style, work on your form. Um, most guys' content is good. Most guys have good takes. Most guys have, like, you know, a really tight analysis of the world. But you have to turn it into something that's enjoyable to read. And that's the real challenge of writing. Mm -hmm. uh, Delicious Tacos, again, has a very strong, consistent voice. And I'm like almost jealous of this aspect of his writing because you can go back and read a post of his from a decade ago, and it's the same consistent voice. Were My you stuff... that guy that did that tweet calling him a dipshit because his writing got worse in 10 years? That no, sounds an no, awful no. lot like that take. <laughs> did you remember this take at all? I do no? remember that. Yeah. I do remember oh, that. No, yeah, for the I... audience, it was hilarious. He was it was just some random thing talking about his book or whatever. And then somebody called him a dipshit and it's like, go back, it's the only author that's he sounds the same through the entire ten years and his writing's gotten worse. And then Taco's response was, Hey, at least I'm consistent, right? And I just loved it. <laughs> I was like, That's awesome. Yeah, uh, no, he's that's that's I think that's a great thing. I mean, he has material. Like, I can't show people stuff from seven years ago just without touching it up. Like, it, it, I would be embarrassed. But like, he's same, been yeah. he's been very good for a long time. And that was what I was gonna say. So the one I found is great for voice. I guarantee you know who I'm talking about. Do you know um, the the blog, the Last Psychiatrist? Yes. Him, I found his. He's my favorite voice of a writer at all. Okay. And he. This is a rumor. If you guys don't know, he's not really Manisphere. He's kind of like a psychiatrist that's really disillusioned with the whole practice and that. He's very good at breaking down this stuff. And he used to, he does similar to you in that it's like there's pop culture intertwined in it. Right. Articles like my favorite one is Real Men Drink Guinness, but don't ask him to pay for it. But here's the thing. Supposedly, he's writing books now under the, the pseudonym Edward Teach. 
And there's a book of his called Sadly Porn, and I've been dying to see if it's him. And I'll know it instantly because, like you said, is that there's a way they put it together that just by reading it, you will know it's them. I would. uh, I've. I have it. It's actually right in front of me. I'm looking at it right now. Um, I wasn't. I wasn't really a reader of his blog because people. I was made aware of him because people started comparing me to him, and I didn't want to read him and then have that. Have right. I didn't want that to tamper with what I was doing. That was a long time ago. So when his book came out, I was told that it was him. I bought it, and it's unreadable and psychotic. That's my take on it. I, I gave up on it. So Son of a... I would love for you to take a look at it. I know Zero HP did a review of it, but uh, speaking to him privately, we shared the same opinion. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, well, that's what worries me, because that sounds like what the thing I took from Sanction. So it might... Uh, we'll see. If, do you at want, least if I do can tell really, us the voice. Do you want to... Do you, would you be interested in a very, very long essay on the play Oedipus Rex? Because that's what you're getting. And you're also getting him do a very long um, kind of erotica story. Oh, yeah. That's the thing. He was promising on doing an erotica thing, wasn't well, he? Well, he delivered. <laughs> you know what? If, I'm re- if I can read the incel apocalypse with a big throbbing dick on it and enjoy myself, I think I can handle it. It can't be worse than Sanction. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I love difficult literature i think i mean uh, comparing this to thomas pynchon is incredibly unfair to thomas pynchon but i Mm. love stuff that's dense and not necessarily enjoyable on a page-to-page basis i'm willing to maybe believe that the last psychiatrist there's there's like a bigger picture there that you have to really work to get but it also just comes off as drunken rambling so i don't know fuck first impressions well that's funny then because the blog is totally it's totally a different one well, both of his blogs. He had this one and another one, um, Hotel Concierge. Okay. But you but you are right with the cup holder. I would suggest if, I don't know, have you given them a read at all or no? The blogs, no. Okay. It, it might be worth just get, scan through one or two. It's it's you, but instead of how you write about dating and pop culture, his is more like pharmacology and okay. pop culture. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I have enough, I mean, I have my own style at this point, so I, I'm not really worried about being, you know, <laughs> influenced. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, well, it's definitely something I could take a look at now. See, and that's the different thing uh, between you, which I kind of like hearing about your process. For me, I kind of like the influence because there would be times where I'll read like a Delicious Tacos blog before I start writing or a Last yeah. Psychiatrist blog before I start writing just because it puts you in a in a, in a certain headspace for a certain type of writing. Like sometimes I want to be more playful. So if I'm right. going through like old Reddit posts for like married red pilled content they want to do, it's going to be very dry and very somber and it's going to read very boring. But if I want to punch it up, I'll read like the same last psychiatrist thing over where he has like very pithy comments in there and it kind of gets me in a different headspace. And while I don't steal from his voice. Right. But I guess that's like the equivalent of watching wrestling before you fight your brother or that one scene from Conan where he has to kill all the dudes in the harem just before you go to the gym, you know? <laughs> sure. <laughs> you're like, sure, why not? <laughs> or, you know, just taking like, uh, if you're, if I'm not, I'm not a musician at all, but I imagine like, you know, kind of like maybe playing your favorite song and tweaking it a bit and kind of getting a feel for the style and then writing something. Oh, uh, yeah, I guess I can go with that. So that's, yeah, that works. I like that. So then uh, this is my other question. So for your style of writing. I yeah. don't know how other styles of writing go. Everybody I talk to, there's some people that are just, um, they just sit down and write like it's a job. I sit down, I write for eight hours, and then I stop. There's other people that wait to be inspired. They're the ones that usually have half-finished manuscripts. There's the ones that prefer the editing, and so the writing is just get it down there, and I'll fix it in editing. There's some people that like just collect blog posts together and then write things to connect the two of them. I'm just curious like where your process goes. Especially if there's an, a, a new artist author out there who's like, I have no idea how to write, but I want to write. And maybe your process is the one that resonates with them. Okay. Um, if you want to write, uh, you should probably start journaling. Um, when I'm really in, when I'm really trying to get myself, I've been, I've been um, doing a lot of editing of other people's work. Um, oh. I'm currently working on a collection of other people's essays, including my own. That's going to be kind of centered on like um, pop culture. So no dating, no sex, like just pop culture. Okay. Um, and that should be coming out uh, probably next year. It's going slow. But um, if, I were, if I were trying to write a book, I would journal every single day. And t- you have to take the pressure off yourself that every word you write is going to be used. Like you need to 
kind of get yourself in a headspace where it's okay to write shit for a day just to write. Um, it is tough when you you kind of are on fire writing awesome shit and you're, you're posting it and people are loving it and suddenly you you have that pressure on yourself again that everything you write has to be awesome and you never want to really put yourself there because it's, it's just it's not going to lead anywhere good so you need right. to take that pressure off yourself that everything you write is going to be used useful good all that stuff so i think journaling every day is is definitely a, a way to start um fill up a notebook page um that said uh I don't outline anything. I, when I want to write an essay, I just kind of start and see where it goes organically. Right. Don't get too attached to an idea. There are some, there are some times where I'll come up with a title that I love and I want to use this title so badly, or I want to make this reference. And it just, you get to a point where you realize it doesn't work. So you have to allow space for the project to take on a life of itself. So, um, don't be, don't be too attached to anything. You know, that idea could always fit somewhere else. That idea is always going to be in your head. It's always going to kind of surface when you need it. Don't, don't be too attached to anything and let things take on a life of their own. Um, and you got to edit. You have to spend time <laughs> editing. You need to do all sorts of stuff. You need to print it out. I hope people still have printers. I don't know if they do, but print it out, have it, on paper in front of you, have a pen in your hand, read it out loud, listen to how the words sound. If they don't sound good, keep tweaking it until they do sound good. So I'm very into how my writing sounds when read aloud. And I think that that makes writing the, the most pleasurable for someone to read. Um, Interesting. So you're like a discovery, a discovery author then. I, I, I don't know what that is. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, there's like uh, two types. There's discovery and uh, what's the other one? Not organization. Outlined. Okay. Outline yeah, no, guys are the ones that set their outline and fill in the blanks. Discovery writers are just like you put everything in place that you need. And then as you write, the blanks get filled in because you have the backstory either in your head or written down yeah. on a spare sheet like that. Yeah. Um, I do think that uh, now... I don't know if this is good advice for someone who has no experience, but I think when, when you start getting experience, like you see the way things feel when they, when they start to kind of fit together on their mm -hmm. own. And it's, it's like a feeling you get. So, um, uh, <laughs> I'm so, so, I'm so sorry. I'm getting a little lost here, but no, that's fine. Things, things come together and, um, you kind of just got to give space for that. It's almost like a give and take with, with the muse, they say, yeah. Um, you don't want it to be like you forcing everything. You need to let things. I some there are so many essay essay topics that I've had in my head for years before I would able to. I was able to be in a place where I was able to get it right. Um, uh, I wrote in Welcome to Hell an essay on partially on Richard Simmons. Do you remember mm -hmm. that one? I th it's been a while, but I think I do. Yeah. Um, how. <laughs> been a while for me too. how uh, richard simmons um it was on it was on the nature of identity and how richard simmons kind of put himself in a place where he was like very he broke himself down to just being a public figure and when that pup when he couldn't be that public figure anymore he became an actual recluse he's still alive but no one's seen him because he really? can't be the ah, you know the crazy super gay yelling all the time guy yeah. Um, I think I think what happened was his mother died, and I think that like devastated him. But since he couldn't be that person, he's not even friends with the friends he had because he just he had such a defined public persona that it kind of encompassed him. So he um, became the brand. He became the brand. Oh, poor bastard, man. I must have rewritten that essay like ten times. I have like draft after draft on in, in my WordPress of stuff where it's like, what am I doing here? Like, I feel like I, I so the, at worst, I was like rewriting his Wikipedia page. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like, I'm, like, I've like paragraphs about deal a meal. And it's like, oh, what am I doing here? Um, you, sometimes you, you'll be thinking about something for, for, for years. Um, I think I, I made a tweet recently how your the book you're writing now should be stuff you've been thinking about for a decade. Oh, I remember and this the one. Yes. The stuff you're thinking about now, will be the stuff you write about 10 years from now. And I think, at least for me, from my perspective, your ideas take that long to simmer, which is why it takes a long time to be a good writer. 
If you're a good writer as a young man, God bless you, but that's a rarity. I think, I think for it all to come together, it, for your form, for your, you know, your, your content, for, for it all to come together, it takes a long time. Well, I think another thing too is nice about it. And I think this is why yours resonates so well with how you wrote versus how a lot of guys just write about how awesome they are. It's because you have the benefit of hindsight and you can have a, a, a 10,000 foot view of your writing. So when you're writing these stories, like you said, I don't want to just brag about how awesome everything right. is because you've had some time to reflect and like, that really wasn't that awesome. Like, it's a great story, but if I tell you the details, it's not as cool anymore. So right, that was like, always um, the joke, like having a threesome or dating a stripper. Sounds awesome. Your friends love you. They'll high five you. But at the time you're like, this is the worst thing ever. Right. Why did I do this? Right. It's like the opposite of a, of a red pill field report. <laughs> where it's like, well, well that's everyone... the good ones. That's the problem is like from the main red pill sub, you really missed out because the married one. Okay. I, I would argue that's far superior. I mean, first off, the demographic is older. So guys aren't like, how do I get the girls? They're like, right. there's this one girl that's made my life hell or how do I move on past divorce? But it was nice because there's, they're like you, they have that, they have that uh, reflection time. They can look back at things honestly. And it was like, some guys were putting in some like super embarrassing stuff just to like get it out of their chest. And then to find out that five or 10 other guys have like, yeah, I did that too. It sucks, but you get over oh, it. Wow. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it's obviously not, not married. I never would have thought of checking it out, but you're probably right. They're probably like all like uh, late thirties, early forties. So. Well, that's yeah, the beauty not... of it too. You have the soul of an old married guy on the cusp of divorce <laughs> already. So you just basically saved yourself half of your cash. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. I mean, like I, I've definitely been there through the ringer with long relationships. I just, I just didn't yeah. get the legal entanglement. <laughs> But it's good though. I mean, that's the part that makes me makes me joyful over all this stuff. Like the fact that we can say, I named off four authors that have the same structure of yours, but four different pieces. But you read through them and they're similar. Same thing as guys talking about their problems. There's like six different types of problems that guys will have. And they're all the same, which is great because that all, like any one of you problems that you've had, there's probably a thousand guys out there who, when they're reading your book, will resonate with them. Maybe not all of them. Right. But probably a good portion of them, like half of them. Yeah. And if you have a solution in here or definitely a non-solution, then it'll work for them. And we're also amazingly similar that all of us can learn from the same general like crusp of material or like engage with the same thing of material. We can all watch the same things. We all watch Rambo three and think it's awesome how he freed Afghanistan with the help of Al Qaeda, you know? Right, 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 right. Which I really wish. You know, here's a peer. You want a pop culture idea that you never asked for them to give you? <laughs> How they ruined the Rambo franchise. Do you remember the new one where he just went to like Vietnam and then just killed a bunch of people or whatever for no reason really? Now, was that Last Blood or do you mean the new one prior to that? that prior was to that. Rambo. The, like Rambo 4, technically. I, I saw it once and I, I do remember a lot of killing, but I, I don't remember anything else. Yeah, it was just gore. It was just like Rambo porn, whatever. But what would have been great, because in Rambo 3, he teams up with the Mujahideen. It was basically a surrogate for Air American uh, Afghanistan policy during the, the Civil War, or Cold War. Right. Killed the Russians, saved the Mujahideen, and then they ended up bombing the Twin Towers like 20 years later. And I'm like, <laughs> talk about a premise for a Rambo film. Imagine having to go back into Afghanistan because it was around that time of the Afghanistan war was happening. And then yeah. you find out like Omar Sharif was like bin Laden and you're like, what have I done? And he has to go in there and struggle. I'm like, that would have been a great story if they didn't just remove it for a bunch of like CG squid sl schlock, you know? Oh, totally. Now, I don't know if there's a theme in there. I don't do pop culture, but if you can kind of do like how people have screwed up such a good thing, a good obvious thing by making crap, but I don't know. I got nothing. I'm just rambling at this point. <laughs> <laughs> what, is it? what did you say? Sound and fury signaling so, nothing. <laughs> and you got you to have something to say or it's just going to be silent. Yeah. So in 10 years, I might have something put together. If you can figure out something before then, it's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. All right. So we got about 10 minutes here. I was going to get uh, closing thoughts on yours. I, here's the question I want to ask. Out of everything that I've asked you and everything we've talked about tonight, you've given awesome answers and I've learned a lot and I've enjoyed myself. What is the the one thing that you wish I would have talked about or asked you, but didn't? And then how do you answer that? <laughs> oh, man. Um, is it hopeless? Um, and I, there are two endings to my book. Um, mm -hmm. I want the reader to work for the real ending. So the last chapter is called After Hours. And right. that's where I kind of circle back to the theme of kill to party. Um, 
obviously that kind of began with me from the outside being critical of Casey Anthony as this atrocious person who, you know, she is an atrocious person who kills her child to yeah. just, just kind of have the freedom of a single woman. And throughout the course of the book, I kind of turned that around on myself and said, well, I, I mean, I didn't, I wouldn't kill anyone, but <laughs> how different am I really? I mean, I avoided, you know, responsibility. I wanted my life to kind of resemble that of like a young sorority girl. Right. And I think that right. a lot of men in the manosphere, red pill kind of, that's their end game. Like I said, if they, they really just want Tinder to flop, right. Tinder to kind of switch around and favor them. Yeah. Um, and what's the saying? It's like, yeah, you're not mad that there's a boot on your neck. You're just mad. It's not your boot or something like that. Right. Right. Yeah. So, um, the last chapter kind of has me saying like, well, why should I, even if I met a nice girl, even if I met a great girl, why should I settle down now that I've kind of like, welcome to hell. I've achieved, you know, I'm, I'm like, I just got to the party. I'm not going to leave the party. Um, well, that's why I asked you at the beginning too. Like the, is the, the purpose of the book, like everybody refuses to be happy and makes the self-sabotaging decisions to ruin it. Cause they don't think they deserve it. That was actually, it was from after hours that I'm like, I wonder if that's, his intent here, but I can't tell if that's more just like an open-ended question for other guys or if that was I, I like definitely a think that the impulse is to, at least for guys in this space is to kind of learn, learn the rules of the game. And by the time you get good at it, you're not going to, you don't want to leave. You want to, you want to use all the tools you've, you've kind of acquired. So, and that's like obviously self-destructive. Ultimately that's a self-destructive impulse. Um, but, like I was saying, how it's it's hard to kind of you, you have this idea that the only real love is teenage love and everything is derivative of that one mm -hmm. perfect girlfriend you had that, you know, since we don't get married young anymore, you kind of that that wasn't even something that was like on your agenda, right? Right. So um the New York dolls put out an album. Now, off the top of my head, it's gonna be really tough to remember the name. Um Sorry, right. I don't know this one. I think it's like some someday will fondly remember even this. Um, and that stuck with me as the New York, you know, that was their reunion album. And you're supposed to kind of look at a reunion album as lesser than the band's original material. So right. their, their album title, you know, um, someday will remember this fondly. Oh, I'm so sorry, Ryan. It's like, <laughs> this is a long day for me. Um, I, I get, get up it. very, I get up very early, but, Same. <laughs> but like their, their album title was like an F you to that. Cause it's like, look, when you're on your deathbed, all of it's going to count. You're not going to say, Oh, that relationship I had when I was 42 wasn't the same as I was when I was 17. It's all part of your life. It's all part of your experience. And I think to kind of give up on certain things, like to give up on the idea of love and romance and having a fulfilling relationship just because it's not going to be what you want it to be at that point in your life, or it's not going to be perfect, or it's not going to be what it was when you were 17 is really cutting yourself short. So the lesson I want people to take away is that um, don't think it's over just because you're jaded. Don't think it's over because you're cynical. Um, really like this is your life and you're going to regret maybe thinking that you're old and it's over by the time you're 40. So you want, I was just like that right there, that line about, I want a fuck boy. It just sticks right in there. <laughs> like, yeah, I get it. It's never coming back, but I'm just going to pretend it's back anyway. I don't know. That's the positive part of it. But the reason I used that line specifically was to segue. I told you guys that uh, the 40 year old with the tits <laughs> came back in yes. the story and you have it in your end notes. Yes. Which I've never seen end notes used like this. Cause I actually, I didn't go back and forth between them as a footnote thing. I actually just read them at the end and I'm like, oh, wow, there's a couple okay. things I missed. Uh, do you mind if I read this section? Please. All right. So he's here's how it goes. I always share my essays with the women who appear in them. Implant lady decided to leave a comment on my blog, which in the spirit of fairness, I will include here. <laughs> and to quote, you 1000% write for attention. Otherwise, you would have never texted me this link to read this shit. You use big words to feel good about yourself and you use your meaningless experiences with women that you meet that are probably in every sense of the word too good for you or, to or too good for you with 106. <laughs> Sick. 
Uh, so keep writing about your extremely exaggerated experiences, hoping that one day someone will read this and give you a shot at something more. Ha ha ha. Good <laughs> luck. Oh, and my tits look amazing. You only wish you got to see them. You know, and she's right. I, I do. I do wish I got to see them. So she. But wins. you notice, I know we brought up Seinfeld a few times. Yeah. Yes, they're real and they're fabulous. <laughs> That's all I could think of there. I'm like, I. This is where I had to ask. Like, is this like an exaggerated version of your life, or is this stuff really happened? Because right there. The fact that I can read through this, know that you were talking about Seinfeld stuff early on, and then instantly think of the Terry Hatcher Seinfeld scene with the fake and real tits. I'm like, I can't tell if this is just because you have enough experiences. Things mm -hmm. are going to rhyme with things in pop culture. Was this sure. just that example there? Yep. Um, no. Most likely, but this, yeah. This was, again, this was, um, this was early in the pandemic. This was a woman that I never actually met. Um, but she gave me enough material to write about. And I mean, you know how it is usually. <laughs> what do you bring to the table? I'll help you write a chapter. <laughs> yeah. um, High quality woman. <laughs> the first, I mean, if a woman is into you, it's almost like a handshake getting her nude pictures. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a crazy thing. I, I like to think, um, you know, back, back, way back before smartphones, if you were dating a chick, and you found out that one of her exes had a single nude Polaroid, you'd be out at his place, honking your horn, ready to kick his ass. Or at the very and least, it, asking it, for the photo back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Check the timestamp <laughs> on the and little just, orange di digits in the bottom there. Exactly. And it's it's hilarious how in today's world, if you're dating a new woman, you 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 have to assume someone has naked pictures of her. Like, it's it, it'd be foolish not to assume that. Yeah. So um, she, uh, I did, you know, she, she ghosted me. I guess she found someone better or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And um, I did send her the thing I wrote about her and she posted that as a comment. So, I, but she's right. I mean, she wins. I do wish I saw them. So <laughs> got me there. Well, I like it though. Cause I mean, say what you will about this. This is engaging. And I always say, like, it's not that you want to have every experience with a girl being good. They just need to be strong experiences. That means yeah. you're ahead of the game. And even with you writing about this horrible dating experience and getting flaked, the fact that you still managed to pull, like, elicit this kind of emotional response for somebody. And I get it. It's words. I'm sure in real life she wouldn't actually be saying ha ha ha. Like, nobody actually laughs out loud on their fucking tweets. Right. But it just shows, like, they're even, even in this welcome to hell hole of an essay of like failure here and failure there and failure this you can still get a rise out of a girl so even in amongst all this there's some charm to it there's a voice to it there's something in there that you can see a guy can talk to a woman in this way and still get somewhere you know yeah yeah i could see that i Having just said me... that if they are amazing yeah. though so there's three ways to get the inserts i learned this from the melissa the single mom with the fake ones you can get the under boob ones Okay. You can get the ones where they cut a, they cut a slit under the boob, and that's the problem is that if they end up being perky, you can see the scars. It's horrible. Then there's one where they cut the nipple, which is what they used to do in like the 80s and early 90s, oh. and that just turns it like horrible scar tissue there. And the new one they do is they make an incision in your armpit, right? And they shove it in there. And if you pay extra money, there's ones where they put them under the muscle, so they still keep the natural feel. It's oh. amazing when a girl gets these how much research they do. It goes from like being like genitals and like very sexual organs into like a purchase of a fucking coach purse. Oh, it's funny. So I, I don't know. Which one do you think? Do you think she got the nipple, the under boob or the, or the armpit? She probably got the armpit. I mean, I, she did. Oh, just... a, a, a woman of money. I can see. <laughs> there's, there's always, you know, um, maybe a little bit of bartering. Like I, I didn't get, I didn't <laughs> get the, I didn't get the full nude, but I did get some bikini pictures at the time. So ah. they, they were they were pretty nice. So what, whatever the luxury implant is, I think she sprung for. Well, that sucks then, because at least if they were the nipple ones, you could sit there seating like every other guy gets rejected. Then like, oh, that chick's just a lesbian. You could have that. <laughs> well, that they were nipple inserts. So nobody gives a shit. About that. Right. <laughs> I got nothing. <laughs> All right. But isn't that your thing about the sulking again that we were talking about at the end where it, when you get rejected, it's not because of anything you did. It's not because it just, you know, things weren't working out. It's because she has to be a lesbian. It's the only reason that works. It's like the old, it's like the oldest rejection response since like the eighties. Uh, what, what are you, what are you asking? 
Oh, there was no question there. I'm just rolling oh. my mouth. At this point, we're out of time, so I just want to talk about how great your book is. If you guys haven't got it, I'll put a link to it in the description. It's on Amazon. Um, are you a stickler over like hard copy or Kindle? Do you think do you prefer people to get one or the other? Uh, I and prefer audiobook. Like... Yay, nay, soon, maybe. Probably not. Um, oh. Audiobooks are tough to tough to make. Um, I think Delicious Tacos is having that problem right now, where you you have a certain sound in your head for what it should sound like. Mm -hmm. Maybe your voice isn't perfect for it, but it would be very hard to get someone else to. I mean, you never know is really the answer, but I don't, I'm not thinking about it right now. Um, yeah. As far as Kindle or paperback, I prefer paperback. I love the idea of physical copies being in the world, but if it's between Kindle or nothing, I want you to read my book. My book is excellent. Um, I poured my heart and soul into the book. I guarantee that if you bought my book and read it, you will love it. So yeah, please buy it in any form you'd like, but I do prefer paperback. All right, easy enough. Okay, I got nothing. Uh, my my thing, how I end these things, is I just run my mouth as I hit the button because I don't have a 